I want to call this meeting to adjourn. I'm nervous. <laughs> Again, <laughs> See, we have quite a few interested uh, residents tonight, and I want to welcome you all. And uh, I do encourage you, if you haven't signed up already, can you hear me? If you haven't signed up already, please do so. If you have any comments to make, please sign up now. Okay. Uh, with that being said, would you all join me in the pledge to the allegiance of the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag. First item on our agenda tonight is Community Development and Planning Director's Report. Director Clary, would you please? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, town staff just wanted to inform the Planning Commission that we did administratively approve an eight, a temporary 800 square foot uh, firework tent that will be located in the Kroger parking lot um, from the dates of June 19th through July 5th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Number two on our agenda tonight is upcoming meetings. On uh, Tuesday, June 20th, 6.30 p.m., we have the Board of Historic and Architectural Review meeting. Also on the 20th at 7.30 p.m., we have the Board, well, that meeting, Board of Zoning Appeals meeting is canceled for June 20th. Then we have a Town Council Committee meetings. That's June 26th, 3 p.m. Town Council meeting, Wednesday, July 5th, 6.30 p.m., here. And if warranted, which I'm sure will be, <laughs> July 11th, the Planning Commission meeting. Okay. Now, at this time, we have public comments. The public is invited to speak to the Planning Commission on any matters except scheduled public hearings. Please use the sign-up sheet, which I hope you have. Comments are limited to five minutes per person. Any required response from the town will be provided in writing following the meeting. Okay, okay we have 11, well, 10 people. Someone scratched off. Was there anyone that signed, wanted to sign up before we started this? Is there another sign-up sheet back there? No. No? You want to get one? I just said it. Just said it. Yeah, it's just add your name, sir. I, re I add your name. Okay. Jason Witcher. Jason? Yeah, W-I-T. Anyone else? Diana Larkin. Where's she at? Oh, you're on the phone. I'm sorry. Thanks. Who else? None? Okay. Starting with those who signed up. Mr. Bill Harris, 329 Grace Street. <laughs> Sir, you've been here often enough. State your name and address for the record, please. <laughs> uh, Bill Harris, 329 Grace Street. Chairman Bryant and members of the Planning Commission, tonight you guys are tasked with coming to a decision on whether or not to recommend Town Council approve the rezoning request by Mr. Luter to have the property known at Tin Grange rezoned as a PMUD. Also, it's tonight that six additional special use permits will be discussed. While the Town Council has heard a lot of public comment on the special use permit request, there has been little said by members of the Planning Commission about whether or not a PMUD is actually a good thing for the historic district. In our opinion, the developer certainly has not made a convincing case that the rezoning of the historic district into a PMUD is, on balance, a good thing for the town. The town has been told the 10-grain zone PMUD would provide a revenue stream to the town both in 
short term and long term, but solid numbers, along with the specifics that support these numbers, won't be revealed by the developers unless they are assured a rezoning approval. Approving something with so many unknowns seems dangerous at best and ill-advised at the very least. So perhaps tonight, as the night citizens will finally hear our planning commissioners provide their understanding of the PMUD and its potential impact on Smithfield. As you consider all that is before you this evening, please remember that the comprehensive plan and the existing zoning requirements direct the commission to vote in a way that is beneficial to the town and its citizens rather than vote to please a developer. To borrow from the medical profession, the commissioner should proceed in an effort to do no harm. So, do the special permits request do no harm to Smithfield? At recent meetings, the development team has said that the primary reason for the special use permit requests is to increase the profitability of the overall project. The density waiver, which would allow the developers to build more than twice the number of dwellings allowed by the existing zoning, will have the effect of more than doubling the population of the downtown historic area. Does allowing a waiver for this density restriction do no harm to Smithfield? Absolutely not. In fact, the opposite is quite true. Doubling the density currently allowed under the existing zoning would place an incredible burden on the ability of our public services to adequately do their job. According to a letter that all of you received from the superintendent of schools, the number of students projected by the increased density will overcrowd our schools require the hiring of more teachers and support staff, and require the purchasing of additional buses. Currently, there are no specific numbers attached to the developer's <coughs> proffers regarding helping to pay for these services. That means, of course, that over the next several years and into the long run, the town taxpayers, who are taxed by the town and the county to support public schools, will have to absorb this financial burden. You also have received a letter from the Chief of Police saying that if the development is approved under the special use permit, the police department will have to hire at least one more officer and purchase the equipment necessary for that officer to do the job, another negative byproduct. You have received similar information from our leaders of fire and rescue and EMT providers. If the Grange is allowed to develop at double density, fire and safety will need to increase the number of fire and safety vehicles, firefighting personnel, and the town again will have to absorb the financial burden. It just seems counterintuitive to say yes to a request on the part of the developer that will resu result in reduced public services, overcrowded schools, and place increased tax burdens on the citizens of the town. The other special use requests are also designed to increase profitability. Setback waivers, reduction of parking spaces, and requesting apartment buildings taller than the current zoning limits are all designed to allow the developer to put more dwellings into the Grange neighborhood. Speaker after speaker, One minute. speaker after speaker has argued that there is simply no place for four-story apartment buildings in the historic district. To their credit, at the last meeting, the developer said that they have to have the four-story apartment buildings to maximize profit, and if they do not receive zoning approval to go above those height restrictions, they would have to withdraw their application. When Commissioner Pope suggested that they add another three-story apartment building, the response that he got was doing so would encroach on the existing green space within 10 Grange. That seemed an ironically ill-timed response, given the fact that one of the development team had not 10 minutes earlier bragged upon the fact that the development as planned now provides for at least 40 percent more green space than required. Adding a three-story building would take away from some of that space but would increase the overall number of apartment units and save the town from the ugliness of the four-story apartment buildings being the first thing our visitors see when they turn onto Main Street into the historic district of downtown Smithfield. One last thought. If the commission feels compelled to expired. recommend the town council rezone as a PMUD, please remember you all can still decide to reject any or all of the individual special use permits. We are counting on you guys to do no harm. Thank you. Second person signed up tonight, Ms. Mary Harris. Good evening, I'm Mary Harris. I live at 329 Grace Street. Chairman Bryan made a statement asking that we go to the property and imagine the development that Mr. Luter has proposed. I did just that. I came away thinking that it is not what Smithfield needs. 
It will not add any character to the downtown. It is just too much. So I'm asking you to spend a few minutes imagining what this space could be that would add to the character of Smithfield's downtown and small town charm. There are many visions that come to my mind. Perhaps as you stand on Main Street, you can see a green space, park-like setting and an abundance of trees, a natural setting that provides a warm and inspiring welcome to those who visit and live here. Perhaps at the front of a front, a visitor center with a well-landscaped parking lot area to encourage parking so that one can walk from this end of Main Street to the other end of Main Street, also providing for overflow parking for Main Street Baptist Church, which remains a very important piece of the downtown historic district. Perhaps an art studio could be located there. Perhaps something that honors the history of this property and those who founded Smithfield. Perhaps a picnic area and a large and welcoming play space for our children. Perhaps some amenities for the townsfolks that really make this a walkable town like we used to have in Smithfield. The possibilities are endless. There's a big difference between a walkable residential area and a truly walkable town. What we are looking at here is a lot of housing, a few businesses with sidewalks and some outdoor space. In my opinion, this does not add anything to the goals of Smithfield. We are not looking at walkability for our town from the right perspective. To make a town walkable, you need to remove the need for a car from the equation completely. So how do we do that? For many years, this town was walkable. We had the essentials of life in downtown that met the needs of everyday living and made it easy for residents and visitors to park their cars and not use them. We had a grocery store, Littles, right? We had a hardware store, Wens, a pharmacy. We actually had a couple of markets as well. We had a, depart a set of department stores. We had Peebles, Delk, a Ben Franklin, all downtown. We have been stepping backwards for the last 30 years instead of moving forward on walkability and reduced traffic. However, we continue to tout our desire and our comprehensive plans to reduce traffic and make Smithfield a walkable town. This development does not get us moving toward that goal. In fact, it does just the opposite. It will bring increased traffic and less walkability. A headline from the Daily Press that I read yesterday is trash, traffic, and constant noise in an article about parts of Newport News. If we do not stop, start limiting and mitigating the impact of development in Smithfield, the Smithfield Times will be able to run this same headline. If a PMUD is allowed to be built on this property, we can expand this headline towards like congestion and gridlock. Is this our future? Is this the vision you see? It is not the future I envision. So again, I ask you to consider alternative possibilities for our very valuable historic area. The zoning change should be denied. Last week, I posed some questions to the town council that I will ask of you. Why aren't we concerned about a plan that due to its density will bring a 160% increase to homes on that side of town? Why aren't we concerned that the traffic estimates are over 5,500 trips a day on residential streets where the town is already receiving complaints about traffic, speeding, and associated noise? Don't you think this is a ridiculous number? The exact quote from VDOT is 5,541 daily trips on the roadway networks. Why aren't we concerned when we know the town infrastructure and current services can't handle the new demand? Why aren't we concerned about the potential cost to taxpayers? No one will answer this question. What is the number? The message being sent is change the zoning and then we'll let you know. Really? Our message should be no public money to support a private developer, period. Why isn't every single member of the Planning Commission and Town Council asking questions that get to the heart of what will really happen in this small town and the charm of Smithfield? Why does it feel to me like you don't care? about the concerns of the citizens. This is not right for Smithfield. You need to deny it. Thank you. Ms. Harris, thank you.
Mr. Rick Lanier, Jr. Yes, and state your name and address for the record, please. Yes, sir. Uh, that works well. That does not, there we go. My name is Rick Lanier, Jr. And uh, let me start by setting my timer, because I don't, I, I'm going to do this right. Here we go. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lanier. Thank you for your. Mr. Lanier. Sir, yes, sir. Your address, please. Yes, sir. 706 Cedar Street. Thank you. Continue. Indeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy and thank you for your expertise. I, as I sit here and, li and listen to you take shots, <laughs> complaints, thoughts, feelings, you do it with grace and I appreciate that. So I, I hope to not waste your time nor my energy as well. Who I am, I am, uh, I am Rick Lanier. I am the son of Richard and Jesse Lanier. I say that so proudly. Um, Husband to Symphony, father to three awesome people. I get to live with them. I look forward to them uh, moving out soon, though. Uh, <laughs> and I am a proud citizen of Smithville. I haven't been here long. As a matter of fact, I, it will be three years July. And the reason by that is because of my father losing a leg. Long story short, this has been a blessing to be in Smithville. I'm speaking because my parents aren't here. They're celebrating my oldest sister. She just retired over 30 years teaching in the Chesapeake school system. Can I get a round of applause for teachers and those folks? They're awesome. Um, so since he's not here, you know what has to happen. <laughs> there has to be a Lynn year speaking. I get to be that person. Thank you. Um, he left some questions and he left some answers also, just like my dad would. So let me just read these questions to you in regards to a concern that is a burden to him. And I say burden because people who are perfectionists want things to be done right. If you know anyone who, has a, who lives by a high standard. So I'll ask these questions with the, in the spirit of Richard Sr. Why? Is there a need for a larger open BMP pond on Main Street? Will closer parking be provided for members of Main Street Baptist Church? Will the BMP pond be a retention pond used to hold the stormwater and not release it? Or a detention pond used to hold back stormwater and slowly release it? These are questions that he would ask if he were here. In addition to that, his, his answers to these things. It's quite simple. You put an underground BMP pond on Main Street. To make it aesthetically pleasing, you put a parking lot with shrubs, trees, and flowers. Because it's Smithfield. And Smithfield's awesome, is it not? It is. It looks good. I like it here. A parking lot on top of the underground BNP pond would be across the street from Main Street Baptist Church, and it just, just sounds right. It just sounds right. So here's what I believe. I'm not, first of all, I'm not a BNP. I'm not a BNP pond specialist. I don't watch natural, National Geographic like looking for these things. But I know someone who does, and it's my father. He's, he wants what's best for Smithville. And with that being said, I, I trust his judgment. I trust his expertise and his research. One He's, minute. Yes, it is. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, Smithville's too special to put something preventable like an open b and pond right on Maine. I think we can do better. I think this, this town deserve better. It deserves better. And I know you all will make the wise decision because of your counsel. So with that being said, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Delinear.
Diana Martin. Hello, my name is Diana Martin. I am a resident of 325 Gray Street. I am coming to you today to ask you to not approve a PMUD zoning for this location. Um, first of all, there's a couple concerns I have. And I've not been able to attend many of these meetings, as many in my age group as I have small children. Today is actually my first day of summer break. I am an educator. So work, family responsibilities have prevented many from attending. And I can say that with honesty because I've spoken to people and I have yet to meet one person who supports this. Many, again, are not able to attend. So my concern is that a PMUD approval would take the power you as a entity supporting our town have to protect us, to protect our historic district, which is so important. Um, this is one historic district that was always looked fondly upon when I worked with the Department of Historic Resources. It was always seen as being respected, as something that was beautiful. And I want to see that protected. And right now we have a few issues that are very concerning. For example, traffic. We don't have the infrastructure to really support as many people uh, that are looked at moving in here. It's not a walkable town. I was almost hit by pulling out of my driveway to go to work one morning. Um, garbage cans were up in front of the way. I could not see a car come speeding down the road and almost hit me as I'm pulling out of my driveway in my residential neighborhood. That's what we are dealing with with the traffic problems. My kids cannot go across the street without me walking with them because there's almost a bre no break during certain hours. That, if anything, is the opposite of what we're looking at. There's a couple questions we have. Like, for example, where are we in getting a four-way stop sign or a three-way stop sign for the streets that run off Gray Street? I think that's something we need to look at. And then why are we putting a main entrance slash exit on a residential street? Shouldn't that be something for a main road? As has been done with other areas like Cypress Creek, a residential street is not a main entrance street for a major development. Um, there are a few other issues. Um, again, the integrity of this historic district. In our historic district, we've got some beautiful homes and people who spend a lot of time and energy restoring and maintaining those homes. By the way, some of those people are selling or trying to sell at this time due to the issues with traffic and what's going on here. Somebody who put a lot of energy in beautifying and restoring and one of these older homes has just left. Others are talking of leaving. This, by the way, is what happened with Hampton. Um, I have family from Hampton. I grew up. I saw it. Many beautiful homes are now being torn down because the people who are able to maintain those are gone. So we have homes. We've got Georgian styles, federal, Victorian, vernacular Victorian homes here. When I saw the presentation Luther made, I saw very little that actually represented what's already there. What I saw was an imitation of some of the stuff they're building in more of the urban areas where they're throwing stuff in York County and parts of Hampton and re what really looks like Suffolk. Do we really want to be that? A district that we looked upon with pride when I was with the Department of Historic Resources? Is that what we want to become? And that's what we're looking at at this point in time. Um, I have some other questions. There's one thing that really, really concerns me. Um, we need more details on the proposed cost-sharing agreement. I'm really worried about that. Why don't we have a definitive number or something close to that? That's almost like going in and buying a car or a house without saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll pay whatever you want. Yeah, let me go ahead. I, I agree to that. We need numbers. We need information. What is our responsibility as citizens in the town and county? One minute. Are we going to be hit double through our taxes to pay for this? As a civics teacher, I kind of understand how taxes work here. Is it something that's going to affect us, cause our tax rates to go up for the county and the town? Or are we going to pay more for services to offset that? What's going to happen to us? Um, Mr. Luter talked about public services amenities. He mentioned a pool. I don't know if the pool is still something that's listed in there, or a pool for their community. Is this pool that's going to be built a community pool for Smithfield, for the, all of the children in Smithfield? Or will it exclude people that do not live in this um, more expensive type housing that he plans to build? Because that's what it almost sounded like. Is this something for all of us? 
or is this something for those elite few that could afford to live there? By the way, as a teacher on just my salary, I could not afford those homes. So there's a lot that you guys have power to protect us Your from. time has expired. We're trusting you. One moment, one moment. Ms. Martin. Yes. Not to be unfair, but I have a question. I probably should have asked it to some of the previous speakers. But I'm asking the question in order for this planning commission to understand clearly about what the residents of this town would suggest as a solution to a vacant lot on one of the main entrances to this town that does not reflect Smithfield's vitality. There's okay, been it's an empty lot full of parked trucks, broken concrete. It presents no aesthetic beauty to what we have there at this moment. And just a simple question, a simple answer. What would you put there? There's been a few people that have come with ideas. I have ideas as to what, what would I would there? love. I'd like some green space, maybe a community pool, maybe some parks. If there were a farmer's market put there, then it would be something that would put people out on the main road. His buildings that look like buildings that are already here, but not this mass density of people. Not, we understand, all of us understand, a development's going to happen. But something that's there to benefit this town, not shove as many houses in a spot. Green spaces, parks, community gardens is something a lot of people have talked about. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Langford Pritchett. <laughs> you can correct me, sir. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Pritchett. Pritchett? Okay. Let me give it a try. I thought I'd give it a French variation. But... Landford <laughs> Pritchett, 5312 River Landing Trail, Smithfield. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think of myself as the new kid on the block. I've only been here about five years. I hurt myself to get here. Um, I'm a retired architect. i uh, worked on some of the world's uh, most challenging projects, including the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, the world's tallest building. The longer story is I'm, a, I'm an eighth generation Virginian. Um, and since I was one year old, I was coming to Smithfield every summer. I, when I finished school, uh, my dad made it clear what my future was by changing the locks the next day. And uh, at, that, at that point in my life, I'd seen two states, uh, Virginia and Carolina. Since then, I've been to all 50 states, all provinces of Canada, and excepting Antarctica, which I have no plans to chalk off the list, uh, all continents. <clears throat> I've lived in uh, Sydney, London, Buenos Aires, Dubai, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and other socialistic countries. Um, I am um, tired of big city problems like traffic, crime, and lines. I moved 2,000 miles to be here for those reasons. My second choice for what it's worth, and, I, and Colorado was beautiful, 30 years almost. My second choice was New Zealand. Um, Talk about the project a little bit, the Grange. This is the front door to your town. And I like the pig on one side. I like the park on the other side idea. And I'm going to get into that in a second, too. Um, why did I pass up all those other things? I want you to remember these three words, small town charm. I don't like this 40-some foot wall at your front door. As you come from the stop, that's your, that's your main entrance to the town. That's what everybody's going to see. It's a 40-some foot wall. And oh, by the way, I'm not a fan of the elevations that have been shared of that hotel for what fits into the rest of town. I also have concerns about the farmer's market. Uh, Mr. Riddick might be interested in this. Uh, I really don't know the numbers, but as I understand it, the people that are going to the, uh, the vendors at the farmer's market now pay, what, 50, 75 bucks to put their booth up for the day, whatever. And I think that's a totally different profile of tenant than what's going to be in the new farmer's market building. How many people are going to fit? Uh, how many people are going to 
want to lease space for six, 12 months in that for just being there for Saturday after, uh, mornings. I, and what happens if that space is empty and nobody leases it? I wouldn't want to see that contract. But the biggest issue with it is traffic. The site plan that I've seen shows 825 parking spaces on that site. With that many parking spaces, it's going to create thousands of more uh, trips per day through 10 in Maine, through the stoplight there. Uh, it, the only way I can see to uh, placate the demand for traffic there is to put in something at 10 in Maine that's not that dis uh, dissimilar to what is at Cypress Creek in 10 right now, and with the hotel sitting there, there's no space for it. And I also disagree with the need of housing in Smithfield. Put it in Carrollton or elsewhere in the county. Um, so going forward, get rid of the hotel and all the housing. And to answer your question that you threw at the last lady, make it a park. Uh, One minute. A dog park, a swimming pool, pickleball courts, uh, enough parking for the vendors and the, uh, the consumers for the farmer's market. Uh, if you do make it a park, you can call it Pierceville Park or Luterville. I don't care. Um, uh, but the citizens here do not appreciate this job. They don't want to see it go. I think a nice park there is your best way to go. Thank you. Mr. Bob Delinsky. Good evening. My name is Bob Delinsky. I live at 210 Cary Street here in Smithfield. And uh, I had uh, a very similar talk that I gave to the town council last week. I want to discuss the traffic issue. Uh, on Cary Street, there was recently a traffic study that was done back in April. Four and a half days, 11,305 vehicles moved up and down Cary Street. And that's an average of 2,512 vehicles per day. Over a 14-hour day, that's 42 vehicles an hour going up and down that street. Now, down near Gray Street at that intersection, those folks don't have off-street parking. They have to park on the street in front of their homes. And those vehicles that are going up and down there, there's dump trucks and all kinds of heavy equipment going up and down there, and there's not enough room. There's about a lane and a half left over. And so these vehicles come around the corner accelerating. I'm scared to death that someday somebody is going to be trying to get into their vehicle they're going to be hit and killed. And that's going to fall on y'all if, if we don't do something about this. And that's without the uh, Grange development. They say 5,541 extra trips per day. The way I look at it, about one third of those is going to end up coming down our street. 2,000 trips a day. In a 14 hour day, we go from 179 vehicles an hour to 322 vehicles an hour. That's crazy. I mean, I try to back out of my driveway and I've almost gotten hit multiple times. In a day, I might, hit, you know, two or three sometimes. And we're talking about walkability. With that number of vehicles going up and down one of our residential streets, this town is not walkable. Not safely. We need to find a way, if you're going to put some development in there, and we all agree that at some point something is going to go in there. I don't like the idea of the concrete slab with all the trucks parked on it. I don't want that either. But I sure as heck don't want a 40-foot wall. I mean, we protect Church Street, the entrance corridor, like it's holy ground, and here, to the other entrance to Main Street, we're willing to put, for, put a 40-foot wall out there. We need to widen the streets. You know, we, um, on Route 10, we need to lengthen those right and left turn lanes to 
uh, allow for those vehicles that are making right and left turns, that traffic already backs up to Church Street on certain days. It's only going to get worse with 300 plus new homes in that development. You know, I mean, we're losing parking for uh, Main Street Baptist Church. We are going to add more trips up and down Main Street. It's 25 miles an hour going up and down there. That it's going to get tied up. We need at least one left turn lane to turn into the Grange development there. The traffic is just too heavy. The current infrastructure is inadequate, woefully inadequate, to handle the extra traffic that this particular project is going to bring. I really would respectfully request that you guys One listen minute. to the citizens who live in this every day. I don't know a one of you who lives in our area who has to put up with this every day. But I would suggest that you come over and spend a little bit of time there and see exactly how difficult a situation this is currently. Thank you. Mr. Dolinsky, same question to you, sir. Yes, sir. What would you put there? I mean, I'm not opposed to putting some, some residents in there, but that density that's proposed is just way too much. And it would be nice if we're going to put those homes in there, put a grocery store in there, put something else in there that we don't have to climb into our vehicles and drive to the other end of town to be able to take care of the dry cleaner, to go to the grocery store, to put a pharmacy in there. Anytime I have to get one of those things, I have to get in my truck and drive to the other side of town. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is Mr. Bob Hines. Bob Hines, 216 Washington. Steve Stewart's editorial in the Times last week captured the essence of where many citizens stand. While I'm not at all suggesting anything illegal has been done, I do have something to say about the process. <clears throat> this whole thing has been somewhat of a flim-flam to the public from the start. While the overall concept of the incomplete presentation of the Pierceville project is a good idea, there are some things I'd like the Planning Commission to consider. In March of last year, I was asking BHAR members that if they had a say in a 60-foot height request, how would they vote? I was interrupted and advised that the members had no idea what I was talking about. As I continued, I also stated that I was not against development, but simply wanted to know how they would vote. All of that's in the March 2022 BHAR minutes. I had emailed back and forth with the town official in an attempt to find out who the individual was that first floated the idea for the 60-foot request. Never could get an answer. Mr. Hines. Yes. If you want people to hear you, I, I thought the microphone. You, I got to get closer to this thing, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't want it to echo. Um, but an answer I did get was that this particular proposed theme mud was put together by a number of entities comprised of town officials and outside consultants. A few months later, after a meeting, I was very sternly rebuked and told to stop talking about the 60-foot situation. I was told it was put in the peat mud by mistake. You folks didn't spend much time debating a mistake. I was also advised that I'd been told this previously. Were you told this? If so, then I'll take back what I just said. Further, I was told that if people on Gray Street were concerned about traffic, they should just move. These things were said to me by one of the persons that I was previously advised was involved in the drafting of the proposed PMUD with all the by right zoning ordinances. Maybe those that want such as this are the ones that need to move to those areas that are exploding with tall buildings and burgeoning population growth and traffic and leave the rest of us here. It has seemed obvious to many that this PMUD was not designed so that a builder might find the property attractive to do a project, but I suggest that Mr. Luda's project is what begat the PMUD. This may be normal procedure. Dr. Pope threw a wrench in the possible easy slide in when he proposed rewriting some of it to make them ask for the variances. We're now here and all the variances are being requested. Oh, let me correct that. At least some, if not all, are basically being demanded. The statement that if the four-story apartments are not allowed, the project will be scrapped. Talk about holding a gun to the town's collective head. If the question is asked, would the other requested variances draw the same response? And now, everything must be approved now. What are the plans for the intersection of Main and Route 10? Many times the day it's really busy. Fact is that Main Street going south 
and Route 10 are just glorified two-lane country roads. <clears throat> As regards four stories, what if Bill Park was somehow able to be sold and turned into residential housing? Would those of you that live over that way approve apartments even up to four stories? The not in my backyard statement at the last meeting was quite condescending and demeaning. It reduces citizens' input as to having no value except pure selfishness. Despite a comment to the contrary, the discussion of building height in this conversation is only relevant to the historical district concerning overheight buildings. Hampton Inn is not in a historic district, nor is it residential housing. In fact, due to zoning height limitations in both the county and the towns in the county, I doubt that there are any four-story apartment structures anywhere to be found. I guess the town of Smithfield will have to be the trendsetter and have set the precedent. The glossing over as regards traffic also assumes that there might not be further development at Mill Swamp Road in the future. There's a lot of open land out there. Mr. Yoko never got a satisfactory answer to his question about traffic flow situation because there is no satisfactory answer. Mr. Luter selling the part of the property for the actual houses to Mr. Rowe was kept quiet until the question was asked in public a few One minutes minute. ago. Why was that? The traffic and population density is too much. Tension pond's a problem, aesthetically and safety-wise. Parking for the Main Street Baptist is a problem. Building heights are a problem. Public-private financial details need to be spelled out better up front. Is the farmer's market as conceived viable? Where is the business plan? No elevators in a three-story luxury apartment building? I quote from my comments to Bihar in March of last year. The group of citizens concerned about this are not trying to stop development. They would just like it to be sensible. Bottom line is this. The proposed project is like attempting to shoehorn a size 10 foot into a size 5 shoe. Something certainly would be good there, but this plan is currently proposed is just not a good fit. Thank you. Mr. Hines, what would you put there? I kind of echo what the other people say. I haven't put a lot of thought into that as such. Houses would be okay, but not with this kind of density. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm fine with uh, residences or even some other things that people have suggested, but I'm not an architect. I'm not a builder. And unfortunately, it's like I've said before, people typically don't come out of stuff. One, people might think that they can't fight town or city hall. Two, they figure your elected officials are doing the job. Yes, what do sir. I need to do? Yes, sir. Simple so, question. What would you put there? So now, you know, yeah. we, we complain when there's a problem because that's kind of life. All right. Thank you, sir. Next up is uh, Reverend James Harrison. Good evening to the Planning Commission members. Mr. Bryan, Chairman, and to those citizens who are with us tonight. Um, my name is James Mitchell Harrison. I live at 658 Old Town Road in Surrey. However, I represent 228 people who attend Main Street Baptist Church at 517 Main Street. A um, couple of comments. Uh, we were in attendance at the uh, town council meeting on last week, and I wanted to ensure uh, that the public understood that Main Street Church is not against development. I would imagine that at some point development is going to happen. However, we are concerned about safety, accessibility for all, and an orderly growth in our community and town. I'm in my 27th year now serving as pastor, and five of those years were spent living in the church manse next door to the parsonage, next door to the church. We support the idea of a best management practice stormwater runoff pond to be underground. I had an opportunity on Sunday to take several members out back in our, uh, on our church uh, property to show them what the underground BMP looked like and how it worked. And they were, I think, very impressed. We installed it when we made the addition, the 11,000 square feet addition to the church 
in 2013. We also have at the Covenant Place Apartments uh, project at 601 Cedar Street another rendition of a BMP pond. This one is above ground. And had we known and understood the difference in the two in 1991 when Covenant Place was built, we would have opted for the underground pond. We support an underground detention system should this development become reality. We believe this will be safer in the proposed location of one of the BPMs proposed uh, in the new development. I understand that there is possibility that there will be more than one. We do support an underground detention system. We are not against development. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Reverend Harrison, same question to you. Suggestions, what would you put there? If it was well, up to you, what would you put there? Well, one of the things that I would uh, love to see there, of course, is housing. You know, housing means, uh, Mr. Bryan, uh, larger church roles. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would do it with much consideration to green space. When we developed Evergreen Acres, one of the things that was a big, big, big concern was the idea of green space. And the underground BMP gave us an opportunity to further contribute to the idea of green space. And even then, when we were doing design charrettes for that particular development, uh, we were looking at and hoping to consider uh, walking trails, um, greenery, uh, adding to uh, that aesthetic value of of being outside. We wanted to be outside. And porches. We did a lot of porches because that was what people were asking for. We gave the citizens, not just the members of the church, an opportunity to participate in that uh, design charrette. And we hope that that might uh, be the case here as well. But that's what I would look for. It is housing, but I would do it uh, with consideration uh, to more green space. Thank you, sir. Next up, we have Mrs. Uh, Susie Gay. My name is Susie Gay. I live at 110 Goose Hill Way. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. After nearly 18 months of communication, coordination, and deliberation with you, we citizens think we have made a compelling argument that the Grange at 10 Main proposal is neither complete nor acceptable, and that the lead developer has shown little or no respect for the work you did collectively last spring to bound the PMUD zoning criteria to ensure conformity with the Smithfield Historic District. We also think that the farmer's market piece of the proposal is simply a dead-on arrival red herring that indebts the town unreasonably and excessively. We acknowledge the appraisal by one of you that this proposal is much more comprehensive than the one submitted by Mr. Darden and Ms. Venable eight years ago. But the fact is that more is not necessarily better Rather, better is better. And this proposal is certainly not better in the aggregate for the citizens of Smithfield. We have documented painstakingly the potential impact of unbearable traffic, the hazards of flood water retention, the projected costs of educating the children involved, and the heavy burden of taxpayer debt involved for a lengthy period of time to reimburse the developer's infrastructure costs. And those of us in town, as you know, we pay double taxes. Lastly, we have tried to point out the rich Native Indian and colonial history of Pierceville's acreage in hopes that an eventual development, or better yet, an appropriate green space project pays tribute to that history. 
Another of you has opined that the 13 citizens who appeared before you at last month's public hearing comprised a not-in-my-backyard minority. We challenge that assessment. Those speakers came from throughout the historic district and nearby downtown. As Mr. Harris summarized two months ago, at least four independent and separate surveys have been conducted uh, on the topic of Grange at 10 Main and public financing. In each case, the opposition has been overwhelming. Mr. Lanford Pritchett's survey elicited response from more than 80 respondents from the town and county. Not one was in favor. I would also point out that eight years ago, when my husband walked the historic district to petition against the Darden development, he secured more than 240 signatures, while only four citizens told him that they were okay with the development. One of those said he thought development would help to attract a Walmart. Two told him they supported the property's development, but not the Darden proposal, as if we had a choice. And the fourth thought, we were simply being elitist. My firm belief is that my husband would secure a very similar result if he walked the town once more. Finally, there is the argument that we are better off working with the developer we know. That might prove true if that developer showed any signs of working with you in return. This one has not. Moreover, Mr. Luter has told us that he plans to develop only the front anchorage of the property. If we understand correctly, he plans to partner with the developer from Virginia Beach to construct the farmer's market, retail spaces, hotel, and four-story condominium apartment buildings, then sell the remainder of the acreage to his other partner from Suffolk to build the high-density retirement homes. We have not been provided with any high definition of what any of these structures would look like. One minute. So we are left to consider the re resume of their recent construction elsewhere. One uh, need only look at the apartment condo complex on Jefferson Boulevard in Newport News, just south of the Whole Foods area, and the retreat retirement subdivision just off Highway 17 in North Suffolk. Neither bears a tribute to anything but the words ordinary and unappealing, which is totally inappropriate for our unique town. We respectfully request a no vote to this development. Thank you. Yes, I'll answer your question. What would you put there? Okay. Along the 10 corridor, there's a lot of noise. So you really can't put any housing there. If you put housing, it would be towards the Goose Hill side with half acre to one acre lots per house. You need a 50 yard competitive swimming pool. Our swim team needs something more than what's at the Y. We know about this because our son was a nationally ranked swimmer. It would be fantastic for the kids to develop something like that with a diving board. I also, for a diving team. And I also think all the gardens in that area and of course the things that the uh, Baptist Church need for the parking and get rid of that retention pond. Thank you. Yes, sir. This is Mary Ellen Berbermeyer. I said Mrs. I apologize. I don't know. I am Mrs. Ms. But okay. my uh, my name is Mary Ellen Biebermeyer, and I live at 355 Grace Street. Biebermeyer. Um, I'd like to also voice some concerns regarding the Pierceville property, also known as the Grange Project. The Planning Commission is tasked with keeping the entrance corridors to Smithfield within certain standards and guidelines as to the look and design of the buildings. Not too long ago, the Planning Commission rightly insisted that the design of the building for the DMV on South Church Street had to have certain look and finish to it to fit in with the architectural standards deemed important to Smithfield. This Grange project, project needs to have the same oversight, does it not? How does building a three or worse four-story hotel building parallel to Main Street provide a welcoming open atmosphere to downtown historic Smithfield. It's a wall for goodness sakes. 
It's hardly, hardly welcoming or inviting. Are we building a concrete corridor? I don't think that it's within the guidelines or standards that the Planning Commission normally works so hard to maintain. While this developer may be the one that the town wants to work with, and fine, whatever, this may not be the right development for this specific area. There are too many unanswered questions at this point. Please do not support a PMUD for this development or you will lose all oversight of this important, dare I say, most important corridor into Smithfield. Second, my second concern is regarding the farmer's market. There are still too many questions that remain unanswered regarding this part of the development. First of all, what is this building going to be used for? The current farmer's market has a festive outside atmosphere where people congregate. It's a sign of spring and excitement when the farmer's market opens. How is this new building going to be used? Is it an inside market or not? Forgive me for asking these questions, but who knows? We haven't seen any plans. Shouldn't we as taxpayers know how this building is going to be used since we are paying a good portion of it? As town residents, we are paying $1.4 million for it, but we're also paying the county portion of $1.4 million as well. I'd like to know how $2.8 million of taxpayer money is going to be spent. In a time when indoor malls are in decline and closing, is it wise to build something that in reality is just an indoor mall? Malls all over Hampton Roads have closed in the last couple of decades. New Market and Coliseum Malls in Hampton, as well as Military Circle Mall, MacArthur Mall, Pembroke Mall, and Chesapeake Square Mall have either closed or in great decline. What are we going to do if the farmer's market closes? What are we going to do with this building? Why do we think Smithfield has the answer to indoor malls? I don't think so. I don't know anyone that goes to a farmer's market and wants an indoor atmosphere. The example that's given to us is one that's in Charleston, South Carolina. Don't get me wrong, I love Smithfield, but you cannot compare Smithfield to Charleston, South Carolina. They have a population of 150,000 people. You can't compare the two. I understand wanting to have a facility for rain days, et cetera, bad weather, but maybe a decent pavilion is all we would need, and that would be much cheaper. We need to be good stewards of taxpayer money. My last point, and certainly most important concern, is one that has not been addressed very well by the town or the developer. Where are the archaeological studies for this property? As the previous speaker said, this area used to be a Native American encampment. We know there has to be evidence of that. Since the Pierceville project dates back to the 1700s, we can wisely assume that enslaved persons lived, worked, and toiled on this very land. Where is evidence of their lives? One minute. Just as important, where are their grave sites? They are there. How can we in good conscience cover their graves with concrete to build houses and apartments over? Are you kidding me? That's what will happen if the archaeological work is not done. We've been told previously that the developer looked but didn't find anything. Really? How hard did they look? We know these graves are there. Look again and keep looking, for goodness sake. We owe this comprehensive study and due diligence to them and all those that lived and worked this land and the sacrifices that they made. With all these concerns, I recommend a no vote on the zoning changes proposed. Thank you. Same question to you. Yes. Any suggestions what you would put there? Uh, I like the idea of more green space. Obviously, other than the backfield itself, which is lovely green, the concrete, I get you. I don't want three and four story buildings there. It does not fit in with downtown. I don't mind extra stores, um, some housing, but the density is too much. I like community parks, community pools, uh, things that benefit Smithfield. If we have a farmer's market there, let's make it an open air farmer's market just like we have now. We don't need a closed in building. That doesn't make any sense. It's just going to be, it's going to be an empty building that's going to sit empty. And we, the taxpayers, have paid for that. Um, so I would, I would welcome more community things. We need a ho another hotel in Smithfield. I don't think this is the right place for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Last but not least, Mr. Jason Witcher. Good evening, council members. A little too close. My name is Jason Witcher. I live at 325 Gray Street. Um, I just have a few notes prepared here that I'd like for you to take under consideration uh, for this development. Uh, first of all, Smithfield's a beautiful town. I think we all appreciate that. I think that Smithfield is well known as a tourist destination for the Hampton Roads region. Uh, there's a reason people come here. It's to escape the uh, urban development that they see everywhere else, to escape the uh, density and the traffic in the apartments and come have somewhere to just uh, walk around and enjoy themselves for the day. Uh, we have a lot of festivals and stuff in town here that people come to. They don't come here to see apartments or pea mud developments. Um, genuine Smithfield, that's uh, the town slogan. Uh, genuine downtowns, I think, don't have high-rise apartments buildings. Uh, they typically don't have new construction, uh, high-density housing. Uh, so that's something to take under consideration. Also, um, being that this is a planning commission, I think that it's fair to uh, take um, the consensus of what you're hearing under advisement. I've heard a lot of people speak tonight and other nights against this development for various reasons, uh, reasons such as traffic, density, uh, not fitting in with the town. Um, I think those are all convincing arguments that should be considered because we are the taxpayers. Uh, we live here, we pay the taxes. Uh, we should have some voice in what happens here. Um, just a few points I want to touch on too. Density, the previous developer eight years ago was turned down because their development was too dense. It had roughly half the housing units that this current proposal has. I wonder why uh, the current one's even under consideration besides uh, the person that's behind the development. Um, so why is it okay now to have that much density? Why use taxpayer money for any of it? For the farmer's market or any of the infrastructure? And speaking of the farmer's market, I come from an area in North Carolina that has an extremely large farmer's market. It's surrounded by a metropolitan area that's larger than Newport News, Hampton, and Norfolk combined, and also has many, many small towns around that feed the farmer's market. This farmer's market is very busy during the summer, but it basically sits dormant six months out of the year. So I wonder how a much smaller area like this can support uh, anything for uh, any amount of time. I think that people are pretty happy with the outdoor farmer's market where it is now. Um, when people finish shopping at the farmer's market, they visit the, tent, the stores and uh, restaurants close by. If you move the farmer's market to the other end of the street, it's very unlikely that many people are going to walk all the way to the other end of the street um, to check that out. Also, people that are you know, at the end of, church, uh, end of uh, Main Street where Church Street is probably are not going to be prone to walk all the way down to where the farmer's market is supposed to be. So again, I wonder why we're being asked to pay for any of this. This is a lot of money. It's a small town, or taxes could be better used uh, other ways. Um, but I do understand it's privately owned land, and the developer does have certain rights to develop it. Um, to answer the question I've asked many people previously, um, I don't really have the perfect answer for this. I think along Main Street should be kept mostly um, open space, uh, definitely some parking for the Baptist Church. Also, for people that come to town for the festivals, because when people do come to town, there's not a lot of you know, parking. They're kind of squeezing in here and there and everywhere. So uh, it would be good to keep the area across from the church, uh, a nicely landscaped, scenic area that's a nice welcome to the town uh, that does have parking for people that do come to visit. And, of course, behind there uh, along Cary Street, um, you know, a lower-density development would be nice, something like you know, Goose Creek or uh, Jericho Estates. Um, obviously, uh, money could be made from One a minute. development such as that. Um, I know the developer wants to maximize their money, but I feel like the town is being bullied uh, into doing everything that the developer wants to do um, to fill their pockets. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Whit Thank you. Well, that is the last name signed up for speaking during this public uh, comment section. It's Planning Commission. Item number four is Planning Commission comments. Okay. I think I will take the lead on this. Maybe set some tone here. 
But I've listened to you, and there are several things I would like to address or question. Uh, as a planning commission, we are tasked with fact finding and advising town council on any application that comes before us. We do not have the luxury of basing our opinion or our decision on what we feel. We have ordinances that give us guidance and we have to be objective and follow, apply those ordinances. Okay? And I understand your concern. You brought up some valid points. I really do understand them. But hopefully we can come up with solutions to mitigate and perhaps solve some of these things, possibly make the application viable or pleasing. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying approve. I'm not saying I personally approve. I'm still sitting on the fence about this. But taking in your comments and what I hope to hear from my fellow commissioners tonight, maybe I can come to a decision. Okay? Now, there, there are several, there were points that were made during the speech. People concerned about expense, what it's going to cost the taxpayer. Understand, and Attorney Riddick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but understand, approval of this application does not spend taxpayer money. That is a decision, depending upon what we send to town council, that town council will deal with. They would deal with that. The proffers, taxpayer money, all that expense covering infrastructure and such, that is their responsibility. It does not mean it is paid, it does not mean it will happen, it would not mean it's spent if the application is approved. I'm saying if it's approved. Walkability. Some people think it does not provide walkability. I really suggest you look carefully at the conceptual plan, the drawing that the applicant presented. And they have made revisions to this effect. There is walkability in this project. They've added sidewalks. They've added sidewalks. They've adjusted their previous, their conceptual plan, they've adjusted to make it more walkable. So I think that is something that is debatable. It's not a no yes. There's no walkability in this. It is. Park pool suggested. That's fine. But who will pay for it? If the town does it, it's your taxpayer money. Who's going to pay for it for, for, for putting that there, for putting those things there? Widening 10 main. Some people think it's not being done, but if you look at the conceptual drawing, there is widening at that intersection at 10 and Main. There is widening provided by the developer in this plan. Okay? And just to add, it's not on the table, but there are people who are willing to lobby VDOT to add a ramp, an off-ramp, from Mill Swamp, Mill Swamp Road on the 10 that would possibly eliminate a lot of traffic going down Cary Street. This is separate from the development, but there are people who are willing, who are ready to lobby VDOT to possibly have that done, okay? So again, I, I, I suggest you look at the drawing itself and look at, really look at the intersection of 10 and Main the developer is adding some value there, infrastructure, widening that intersection. Housing, green space. Well, it is housing coming with, that would come with that. And there's green space that would come with that. Swim pool, that's up to the developer, that's up to them. The comment was made, P mud. If this was passed, it would take away the Planning Commission oversight. 
that is not true. The planning commission, that is our purpose. Regardless of whether it's a, a waiver, a special use permit, an exception, whatever it is, and regardless of the zoning, P muds, suburban residential, downtown residential, historic district, the planning commission still has oversight on what is a, presented and recommended to town council. We do have oversight. And that'll be addressed in the application. And with that, I would like to hear other commissioners' comments. Please let the public know what is your issue, where you hung up at, what do you support? Mr. Barnes, Mr. this is coming up, at a, at, it's your last action item on the agenda? Yes. That's probably the best yes. time for everybody to speak to that. Okay. I'll accept that. Yeah. But no, I'm expecting comments. The public is expecting your comments. Town council is expecting your comments. Be ready. When that comes up, be ready. Now, is there anything else any other commissioner want to say, speak to at this time? General, in general, not necessarily this application, but in general, does anyone else has any other concerns or comments that they would like to make at this time for the planning commission? No. No, you're not a member. Oh, Please. But you didn't ask. No, this is planning commission comments I agenda. Uh, you missed that opportunity, ma'am. No, you didn't ask. No, the list was back there to sign up. And, and, and this, this is not going to be discussed. The list was back there. I'm sorry. If you were late, I'm sorry. I wasn't late. Well, okay. I asked when I started this meeting, was there anybody at the last minute who wanted to sign up? Okay. Mr. Brown, before you move on, can I say something, please? Yes, sir. Um, I'm a big boy, and so I take my medicine when I should. And uh, I want to apologize sincerely to the Planning Commission for my comments at the last Planning Commission meeting. Um, my statements were not directed at any of you, and certainly not to Dr. Pope. Uh, he said something that was attributed to someone else that caused me to uh, re offer remarks. And um, certainly it was not anything that you said, Dr. Pope, and certainly my comments were not directed to you. Uh, uh, I'm a uh, my response to you is in defense of both the town council and the planning commission because you're my clients and I'm a lawyer and I defend my clients. And um, when, I, when I know there, there are false claims being made, then I rise to the occasion and that's what I did. Uh, I know that none of you nor any member of the, plan, of the town council is engaged in any illegal or improper conduct or meetings with the developer or anyone else. And so I felt it necessary to reiterate that uh, nevertheless, I could have delivered my comments in a more, um, in a less strident way, and for that, I'm truly uh, sorry about that, and I apologize to you all. Okay, yeah. Turner Riddick, thank you. I'd like to uh, remark to that the stuff that uh, Steve Stewart put in his opinions, I thought were way over the top. The criticism was was way too much. And I was very disappointed in the Smithfield Times as far as that, uh, that goes. On the other hand, I will have to say that uh, Stephen Filosky, I, I read his remarks about the entire Grange thing, and I find that he has been very capable in, in, in presenting the facts without comment which is something that Mr. Stewart has not done. Thank you. Commissioner Davis, thank you. I like to, um, I don't know how I want to say it, but most people don't know Mr. Riddick. If you do, what happened last month, you know that's totally out of character. Bill Riddick is one of the finest lawyers. We, as a community, ought to be very proud. He's our town attorney. He does a good job. Everything he does is on the table. Nothing is done behind closed doors or under the table. He's not going to be involved in it. He will try to get it resolved. Thank you. Amen. Dr. Pope, nothing? 
Vice Chair, you're the guys? I'm good, thank you. Good for now. Nothing? Mr. Chairman, I think this is best not, this that, is not application. Uh, that, that I, I keep all comments on the Grange uh, to myself, as yes, I've been trying to do for many months and, and will continue to do along uh, this evening. Okay, we understand that, and it, yes. And I think you've uh, done that quite well. <laughs> but um, do you have comments on anything else? No, sir, not at this time. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I say my comments to item eight on the agenda. Okay, all right. All right. No further comments from the commissioners. Item four is closed. Okay. Item number five. We have a site plan. Thank you. We have a site plan amendment application. This is 604 Cypress Creek Parkway. Cypress Creek's owner, Association Incorporated, care of Gail Bletcher, the applicant. Director Clary, could we have the staff report, please? Yes, thank you, sir. The applicant is seeking approval to install a 20 foot by 40 foot, 800 square foot rectangular vinyl pavilion with concrete footers. The structure will have an overall height of 14 feet, 10 and a half inches. It will feature green um, asphalt sink shingles, which will match the clubhouse, and wooden columns wrapped in vinyl. The structure will be located about 50 feet from the back of the fence, encompassing the community pool, and approximately 60 feet from the corner lot line. Uh, the, also, the applicant is also seeking a second site plan amendment. This is for a canopy structure that's approximately 12 feet by 24 feet which would be located on the pool deck and it would match the existing canopies on site. Uh, town staff do recommend uh, approval as submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? If so, would you wish to add anything to the application? Okay, thank you, sir. Planning Commission, any comments? Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, suggest that this is a simple site plan amendment to the uh, Cypress Creek pool. It's done properly, meaning not after the fact. It sits within the guidelines. Uh, it is recommended by staff. I have no issues with it. And with that, I make a recommendation, or I make a motion that we approve as presented. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. This must be an easy application. <laughs> One of the easier ones we've seen, sir. Okay. <laughs> and thank you for approving it, uh, applying ahead of time. We appreciate that. We're trying. We're trying. Yes, instead of after the fact. We have a motion to accept this application as presented and a second. There's no further discussion. Call for the vote, Director Clare. Mr. Davidson? I'm yes. Go ahead. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Pack? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Thank you. This application passes as presented. Mr. Chairman? Yes. If I may. Our next two public hearings are on the Chesapeake Bay exception application. And my question, I guess, is to Director Clary and, and, and perhaps Attorney Riddick. These typically are BZA handled Board of Zoning Appeals, as, as, as I've seen in the past. I don't remember one coming in front of Planning Commission. Is, is it appropriate for it to be in front of us? Yeah, it doesn't go to BZA. So Chesapeake Bay exceptions are all handled by Planning Commission? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah we, we've had some. It's been a, been a while. Okay. The next item. Item number six is a public hearing. This is Chesapeake Bay exception application. Uh, this is a tax plat. 399. Fleming and Diana Mills is the applicant. Could we have the staff report? 
Yes, sir. Thank you. The applicant wishes to obtain a Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area exception in accordance with Smithfield Zoning Ordinance Article 3P, Section I-4. This is to construct a new elevated accessory structure, which is approximately 9 feet by 14 feet and 15 feet tall. This is pursuant to Article 3P, D-4A, as this parcel was identified as an IDA, an intensely developed area. IDAs were identified for redevelopment, where at the time of the initial adoption of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area, little of the natural environment remained. This parcel qualifies as, de as development of the bulkhead gravel parking lot and additional development has severely altered the natural state of the area such that it has more than 50% impermeable surface. The proposed structure is approximately 126 square feet and is located within this IDA which serves as a redevelopment area. Any ground disturbance caused by the construction of the structure would require appropriate mitigation as specified with natural plantings to state standards for RPA restoration. In accordance with Article 2B12, the structure shall not be located closer than five feet from any lot line. Town staff support this application with the suggestion that the applicant constructs the structure in the footprint that does the least amount of disturbance within this 100 foot RPA as possible and the applicant is required to comply with landscaping mitigation requirements. Moreover, FEMA is in the process of updating the town's flood map and we do believe this location is projected to be located in a Limwa area, limit of moderate wave action area. Uh, because of this information, staff do request that the structure is elevated and dry floodproof according to FEMA standards. Dry floodproofing does include, but is not limited to remaining less than 600 square feet in size, not used for human habitation and used for parking and limited storage only. Uh, for clarification, the applicant is not seeking any of these uses. Uh, town staff do suggest that any approvals are contingent on the Board of Historic and Architectural Review approval as well. The strengths, this parcel is classified as an IDA where the natural state of the buffer has previously been altered. Uh, the weakness is this approval of this application would result in the development and disturbance within the 50-foot landward RPA buffer. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Yes. Would you like to make a statement, sir, and add anything to your application? No, that's not, that's not okay. This is a public hearing. No one signed up for or against. Is there anybody, is anyone here that would like to speak for or against this application? Now, seeing none, Planning Commission comments. I'm sorry. Public, hearing. public hearing is closed. Planning Commission comments. I looked at it and it's, it's already developed. It's already in it. Uh, uh, clear space there as far as the buffer. This is what they call the IDA. And that's because it was built up mostly to the edge of the water prior to the Chesapeake Bay preservation over, overlay. It was done prior to then. Yes, at one time, um, Mr. Chairman, we had a present, um, an application for some condos to be built there actually um, several years ago. Uh, I think the structure is attractive. I think Bihar will look upon it favorably as well. And um, if, if no one else has any comments, I would move for approval with staff recommendations. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve this application with the conditions set forth by town staff as presented. Call for the vote. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Pack? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Okay. Mr. Davison? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Thank you. This motion passes. The application is approved. Item number seven on our agenda tonight is another public hearing. This is on the Chesapeake Bay, Ch Chesapeake Bay exception application, tax plat 098, Michael Rose, the applicant. 
Do we have the report, please? Yes, thank you, sir. The applicant wishes to obtain a Chesapeake Bay preservation area in exception in accordance with the Smithfield Zoning Ordinance, Article Section 3P, Section I-4, to construct a new single-family dwelling on a pre-Chesapeake Bay preservation area lot that was recorded on or around March 2, 1978. The Smithfield Zoning Ordinance, Article 3P, Section G3C2, Two, permits encroachments into the buffer area provided the proposed single family dwelling meets the following conditions. One, encroachments into the buffer area shall be the minimum necessary to achieve a reasonable buildable area for a principal structure and necessary utilities. Where practical, a vegetated area that will maximize water quality protection and mitigate the effects of the buffer encroachment into the buffer area shall be established. And three, the encroachment may not extend into the seaward 50 feet of the buffer area. The proposed single family dwelling will encroach approximately 50 feet into the landward 50 foot of the 100 foot RPA buffer. To help lessen the potential impacts to the RPA buffer, the applicant will also be requesting a special yard exception in order to encroach into the 35 foot front yard setback, providing a front yard setback of not less than 27.44 feet. This project would result in approximately 3,000 544.63 square feet of dwelling, and this would be located within the landward 50 foot of the RPA buffer. Any additional disturbance caused by the construction of the dwelling would require appropriate mitigation as specified with natural plantings to the state standards for RPA restoration. Town staff support this application with the suggestion that the applicant constructs a single family dwelling in the footprint that does the least amount of disturbance within the 100 foot RPA as possible, and the applicant is required to comply with landscaping mitigation requirements. Additionally, town staff suggest any approvals are contingent on the successful acquisition of a front yard exception from the Board of Zoning Appeals. The strengths of this application is the RPA buffer area would result in the loss of a buildable area on a lot uh, recorded prior to October of 1989. The weakness, this application would result in development and disturbance within the 50 foot landward RPA buffer. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Yes. Is there anything you would like to add to the application, sir? Sir, you have to come to the mic if you're going to speak. And then please, name and address for the record, please. Yeah. Name is Michael Rowe, 405 Lane Crescent, Smithfield, Virginia. Um, the only thing I was going to add, I mean, we had the mitigation plan and so forth, um, is the fact that now this property has been in my family for over 50, well, 50 years, over 50 years now. So I just want you to keep in mind, this was, I think, before the Chesapeake Bay uh, Preservation Act. So... That was the only thing, just keep that in mind. Um, we got the mitigation plan in, in, in place, so I think she's covered everything else. And that was it. So. Okay. All right, thank you. So wait, wait a second, sir. Well, I'll ask you later. I'll, I'll ask you later. Okay. <laughs> this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the public who wishes to speak for or against this application? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Planning Commission comments. I have a question here, Ms. Clary, perhaps. Uh, I'm looking at the site plan and it looks where the proposed dwelling is. And the proposed dwelling uh, stays within the 100 foot setback, but, but does not go into the 50 foot RPA setback, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. So when the Chesapeake Bay Act was originally proposed, there's a 50-foot RPA, and then shortly thereafter, they, they made a 100-foot RPA. So if we were to deny this application, this would be an unbuildable lot, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And also, according to your report, uh, in order to get this dwelling in its desired configuration, they are going to need a front yard exception, which would be, come from the BZA, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Just making sure I understand the application in front of us. Thank you. My question on this is, what about accessory things, sheds, decks, and things like that? Is all of that encompassed within this site plan that's before us? All the storage, everything else that's necessary and needed, is that all included in this rendering? We would not permit any accessory structures. Okay. 
Yeah, some time back we had a similar application. I think it was on, uh, I think it was Smithfield Boulevard. There were some lots there that had some of this uh, Chesapeake Bay. That's where this is. That's where this is. Yeah. It, it was closer to Church Street. There were, I think it was three. I think it was three lots. That was with when Mr. Steffi, I believe, was in front of us. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. That that was uh, there. There were some uh, wetlands that had been created uh, in, in a pine forest there. So it's not exactly the same because this is this does go back to the marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, there is a creek behind here, and I forget the name of it. It may be part of Jones Creek. Uh, but it's a very small, small creek back at this point. But there is there is a creek, and this is tidal uh, wetlands behind this property. So it's a little bit different than, than the property that Mr. Steffi had. Okay. My issue with this thing is I, I did visit the site. And it is natural. It is natural. Uh, a lot of trees and, and just leaf covered ground. But the difference I see with this one is it's not an IDA. It's not intensely developed. It's not an IDA. Now, reading our ordinances, Permitted encroach, encroachments into the buffer area. They're permitted. And as you said, we approved this. It does make it buildable. But my question is, my concern is, that number one, encroachments into the buffer areas shall be the minimum necessary to achieve, achieve a reasonable buildable area for a principal structure and necessary utilities. Okay? And then two, a vegetated area that will maximize water quality protection and mitigate the effects of the buffer encroachment into the buffer area shall be established elsewhere on the lot or parcel. And three, which is most important to me, the encroachment may not extend into the seaward 50 feet of the buffer area. That's a seaward. It does not. It does not. I understand that. But I go back to number one, shall be the minimum necessary to achieve reasonable, buildable area. Can I explain, Mr. Chairman? You may. The Chesapeake Bay Act was adopted in 1979, and as Mr. Pack said, the original setback was 50 feet. And thereafter, they increased it from 50 to 100. But all that, set all that aside, these lots were designed when there was no setback. So this lot in 1979, when it was platted, was a perfectly legal, buildable lot with no restrictions whatsoever. And the government, that's us, we came along and we imposed restrictions on it that made it, um, that imposed these restrictions we're talking about, the CPBA restrictions on there. And then shortly thereafter, after 1979, not only did they go from 50 feet to 100 feet. So the governmental action has essentially made this lot unbuildable when initially it was a buildable lot. And so there is an exception in our ordinances that allow for this relief. Um, otherwise, you are effectively taking their property um, for any reasonable use. Um, they are within the 50 foot, they're on the, on the landward side of the 50 foot line. They do encroach into the 100 feet, because if they don't, there's nowhere else to build. They have no other option. I understand. But I'm getting at, my question is, is there any allowance to encroach into the seaward 50 feet? No. There's no allowance. No. And that's my concern. <coughs> the applicant 
took full advantage of the landward 50 feet and asked for encroachment all the way up to 50 feet. What they now, if there's an error in the construction, calculation, surveying, or whatever, if there's an error and the applicant encroach into the seaward 50 feet, we have no recourse, I believe, at the time we have no recourse, and we will be at the mercy of the Chesapeake Bay. They, they better not. I've, I represented a client who had just what you're talking about, and he built the house one half brick into the seaward side, and he was required to remove it. So uh, it's, a very, it's a strict standard, and there's no relief that you can grant him. We so he's on, on notice that he cannot encroach past the 50 foot into the seaward side of the 50 foot box. Is that but, including his overhang or building itself? Another point. Well, they, Why he's maximizing it to the edge. It's the, the overhang doesn't encroach. Okay. It's, it's the foundation. You measure from the, you measure the foundation. It's the footprint. It's the footprint, yeah. yeah. We require an as-built survey before we release the CO for the new construction. Okay. My suggestion is we reduce that en encroachment maybe two feet. That will leave room for error. He's got a foot. He left himself a, a 1.12 foot margin on the left hand back corner and 1.39 on the back. Right hand corner. It's, mm -hmm. you, you're trying to help. You're trying to save him from himself, Mr. I am. Okay, but but that's not your job. If he if he, he's on notice, it's on record. You, I'm sure he's heard everything we just said. He has to he has to comply. That's his contractor's job. That's his yes. contractor's job. That's what surveyors are for. Okay. The second issue, I don't see it in the application, but I don't see any vegetation mitigating. Did I miss it? We have been working with the applicant um, in order to provide us with a, a mitigation plan that's acceptable that meets the, the requirements of the plantings. That's, okay. part of, that's part of his site. That's part of his site. I'm sorry. If you have anything to say, please come back to the podium. No, oh, uh, Mr. Rudd. Yeah. Yes, the applicant. That's a. Uh, that's part of his site plan process. When when he submits his app, this you got to say yes before he's going to spend money on a site plan. <laughs> mm-hmm. If if you say no, he's not going to spend that money. But he has to. That's something Ms. Clary is going to require that he do. To, in order to satisfy the requirements of the ordinance. He'll have to design whatever element is called for by the ordinance in order to mitigate his impact on the encroachment. But we don't make him spend thousands of dollars before he gets here tonight, because you might say no. Okay, understood. And that can be a recommendation of our approval, Mr. Chairman, that he, that he submits a, a mitigation plan that is, meets the town's Which requirements. Which I have a copy here if you... Want that? Okay. Because I did have a copy. No, you can present that to Director Clary after the meeting. Okay. Do you want to know? We have a copy. She you probably have a copy. has one. Okay. Okay. Mr. Rowe, Mr. Rowe, will you stay there? I have a question when it's my turn. Please. On your pr presented site plan, you have an outline of a building. Is there any decks on the back of this property? No. Uh. Uh. Do you wish a deck? Because you do have some area in there, and if we make a recommendation to the town council, would he be able to come back at a later date and add a deck, even if he stays within that 50-foot landward side? Good question. He, he, he doesn't get more than he's asking for. I understand that, but I'm giving him an opportunity to ask for more before we make a recommendation. He'd have to come back and make another request. I'm just making sure he understands that if he needs a deck on the back of that house, he's got a little bit of wiggle room. And he should ask for that before we make a recommendation or a rendering tonight. Ask for a deck, Mr. Rowe. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I know in that one uh, corner there, there is room for, I think, for a, uh, for a deck or something there. And no, I didn't realize that I would have to come back. Well, I guess I did realize I had to come back, but I don't know that it would have been disapproved at that point. So it's at this point, I think I would like to request that it be 
able to add a deck. <laughs> oh, I just want to, I want to make sure I am correct, but if I understand if we make a recommendation that's approved by town council, then what you have because of the restrictions you're stuck with. I know anything, that. Anything that you need, you need to ask for it now. So, and am I wrong on that, Mr. Rick? You're not wrong. So please think about this before it goes further. So, yes. You might I want to amend your application and come back to see us next month. So if, if y'all would approve it with a deck within that, that doesn't encroach on the 50 foot. Uh, no, we can't encroach into the 50 Yeah, we don't want to. No, if, if I build the deck that doesn't, doesn't encroach into that back right. 50 foot. We would need to see that prior to approval. Yes, Mr. Mr. Right. Rowan, they're being very nice to you and suggesting yeah, that. to you <laughs> that if you want a deck, the appropriate thing for you to do is to take your application and amend it and, and draw in a deck and tell us how much more uh, coverage you need in order to... That's what, that's, right. that's what you need to do. And so the nice thing to do would be to request them to table your application the next month so that you can revise and amend your application. There won't be another public hearing, but they can take up the app, they can take up your revised application next month and get you what Dr. Pope is suggesting you might want. Um, and you don't have to pay Mr. Canada to do that for you. You can amend that so we yourself can just add and that resubmit to it. That. Um, actually, uh, yeah, that would be great if, if we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to save you money here too. Yes, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. So then let's do that. Can we just table it for this <laughs> session? If you're okay with that, I would make a motion to do that for you. I'd make a motion to that. Do. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we table this application so the applicant can resubmit to get what he really wants. Second. Okay. We have a motion to table the application and a second. And to be clear, he doesn't have to come back for the next one. He, he, t he has time, right? Well, he, he can take as long as he wants. He, he, uh, is your motion to table it to the next regularly scheduled meeting? And, and I think that's the appropriate motion. And if he's not ready, he can ask Ms. Clary to defer it yes, again. Yes, table it to the next regularly scheduled okay. meeting. Yes, sir. I would, like this is pretty easy for you to do, Mr. Rowe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you just yeah, need to get in touch with Ms. Clary. Just no, okay. Draw, draw us a picture. <laughs> Okay. All right. We have a motion to table this application and a second. Call for the vote. Mr. Pack? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Thank motion you. to table passed. Right. You have another opportunity, sir. All right. Thank you then. Okay. See you next month. See you next month. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Before you open <laughs> item number eight, <laughs> once again, as I recuse myself, I have been advised uh, that as I have some interest in the Grange being, being talked about, I will be best served to leave the room. And so at that time, at this time, I will be leaving, sir. So. Thank, thank you all, and you have a lot to consider tonight. Are you looking for investors? I have zero comments, Ms. Hillegas, but thank you very much. And good night. Good night, Councilman Pat. Good night. Yeah. Give me some money. Okay, we've done the easy part. <laughs> Took this long Item number eight, rezoning future land use map amendment and six SUPs, special use permits, tax plat 000117, the Grange, LSMP, LLLC, care of Melissa Venable, the applicant. Can we have the staff report, please, Director? Yes, thank you, sir. The applicant is proposing to construct 304 total units. There will be five cottages, short-term rentals, 34 55-foot duplex unit lots, 
14 60-foot wide single-family dwelling unit lots and 39 65-foot wide single-family dwelling unit lots and 212 apartments. The proposed development will not be age-restricted and will be privately maintained regulated and maintained by an owner's association. There will be a variety of amenities included, uh, including two swimming pools, uh, bike racks, street lighting, and approximately 12 acres of open space in community garden parks, uh, pickleball courts, and dog parks. This project also includes the two-story Smithfield Market, which will host at least one restaurant, retail space, and several vendor spaces. The three-story hotel that's also included will not exceed 42 feet in height uh, and will feature a retail space and a restaurant space. There will be a one-story retail building, two-story professional office, and one-story medical office building. The proposed development can be accessed via five entrances, one on the future extension of James, the extension of Grace Street, two off Main Street, and a right-in only off of Route 10. Following the site-specific nature of the PMUD, the applicants have crafted their application to include the following. Uh, first, we have the conditional official zoning map amendment, which is the rezoning. The desired use of the property would be classified as single-family attached and detached dwellings, duplex residential dwellings, and a mix of residential dwellings uh, as set forth above, community buildings, swimming pools, quasi-public parks, fields, and related facilities. Eating establishments, hotels, offices, and medical offices, along with retail sales, all which are permitted uses in the Pima district. The applicants are also proposing multifamily residential dwellings, which are permitted in the Pima only after acquiring a special use permit. Secondly, is the comprehensive plan amendment, which is the future land use amendment. Uh, the near entirety of the parcel in question, it, in, the property in question, is designated on the flume as commercial mixed use. Uh, this designation encompasses approximately nine parcels, which make up the majority of the proposed site. There's one remaining parcel um, that's designated on the flume as historic district residential, and there's remaining 10 smaller parcels that are designated as historic district slash mixed use. The first special use permit is for multifamily residential dwellings. Uh, this is for the 212 apartments. They will be located on the east side of the property close to Route 10. They will be comprised of five three-story buildings and two four-story buildings. Three of the five three-story buildings are 15 carriage houses over garages. Uh, the proposed multifamily buildings will feature a maximum height of 52 feet for the four-story and 39 feet for the three-story. Accompanying the multifamily residential development will be a two-story clubhouse, less than 35 feet in height, with a pool and a dog park. The second special use permit is a waiver of maximum density. Uh, this is a waiver of allowable density for the, according to the Smithfield Zoning Ordinance, the maximum allowable density for the multifamily dwellings would be the 12 dwelling units per net developer acre. The applicants are proposing a density of 27.5 dwelling units per acre for the multifamily dwellings. The overall density for the entire project is 7.9 dwelling units per acre, and that's including the single family and duplex units. Isolated, the single family and duplex dwelling units are at 3.4 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the PMA does allow for eight dwelling units per acre for attached dwelling and five dwelling units per acre for detached dwelling. The third special use permit is for a waiver of maximum building height. Uh, this would be for the two four-story multifamily apartments and the five three-story multifamily apartments, along with the hotel. The two multifamily buildings will not exceed 52 feet in height, and the five three-story multifamily buildings will not exceed 39 feet in height, and the hotel will not exceed 42 feet in height. The remaining buildings uh, will not exceed 35 feet in height. The fourth special use permit is for a waiver of parking and loading requirements. The applicants are seeking um, an SUP, uh, which requires the Smithfield Zoning Ordinance requires two parking spaces per dwelling units plus one for the visitor for every three units in the multifamily dwelling. And Article 8B4 requires off street parking to be located on the same lot. The applicants are providing two parking spaces per unit for the multifamily dwelling, which is 424 spaces instead of the required 495 parking spaces. They are also proposing a shared parking agreement for the development, including off-street parking. 
Finally, the applicant's also seeking relief to allow off-street loading spaces to also count towards required parking spaces. The fifth special use permit is a waiver of yard requirements. Um, this would be for relief um, from the setbacks. Um, the commercial yard setbacks, they are proposing a zero foot front yard setback, 10 foot side yard setback, and 20 foot rear yard setback. For the residential, uh, the applicants are proposing a 14 foot front yard setback, a 10 foot side yard setback, and a 25 foot rear yard setback. Um, additionally, the applicants are requesting a waiver for the yard requirements in order to allow a smaller setback requirement where the property is contiguous to a separate zoning district. This would be the downtown for the two properties for the schoolhouse museum along Main Street. The sixth special use permit is for the short-term rentals. Each, uh, there will be five short-term rentals. Each unit is a single detached family dwelling that will be utilized as a rental property. Uh, the enclosures uh, are included in the application package along with the updated enclosure six, which were the comments from VDOT. Uh, pursuant to the Smithfield Zoning Ordinance Section 4E4, the Planning Commission has until Thursday, July 20th, 2023 to decide on this application before it is automatically forwarded to Town Council with a recommendation for approval. This application did appear on the Planning Commission agenda as a public hearing on Tuesday, May 9th, 2023 and as a discussion item at the Wednesday, May 24th, 2023 Special Planning Commission meeting. Uh, please keep in mind, based on the comments received and in accordance with the documentary study, town staff do suggest archeological monitoring of ground disturbance during development. Um, comments were received um, and do follow this staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Director. One other thing, Mr. Chairman, um, pursuant to the receipt of the new VDOT letter, the, one of the recommendations in the VDOT letter was that the proffers be amended to reference the most recent um, McPherson traffic impact analysis, and that's been done. So they, might, they, uh, they submitted a revised June 2nd proffer statement that may, references the May, the May 2023 traffic impact analysis, which is that's set forth in the VDOT letter. It also required that they um, agree to dedicate right-of-way along Main Street and Grain Street for the widening of uh, Route 10. And pursuant to the developer's, uh, well, recommendations or, or uh, suggestions by the Planning Commission and an agreement by the developer, they added number 2G, which says that the governing documents of the property owners association shall acknowledge that all property within the development must comply with the historic district overlay, notwithstanding the fact that some of the proposed units are located outside of the historic district overlay. The owner proffers to consent to the amendment to the historic district overlay boundaries to include its entire development, if so desired by the town of Smithfield. And if you recall, that was one of the general concerns that the historic, the historic district did not cover the entire property, and the developer said that they were willing to make all of it subject to the guidelines. So that's been done by profit. And just for clarification, this entire package is the second tab on the PDF. We did separate it from the rest of the agenda for convenience. Thank you. The second tab, okay. Can I ask a question? This is for you, Mr. Riddick. If there are some kind of archeological finding, a body is exhumed while digging of anything, what happens? They stop. Is that something the state is very involved in if something yes. happens? If, if something is discovered, then they have to call, I think it's DHR, and they come in and they put a essentially stop right then and there, and they, they stop work in that area, and they come in and they require much more, um, uh, I'm not, an archaeologist, a state archaeologist, or maybe a, prof, uh, a private archaeologist come in, and they do uh, further analysis to determine if there's something really there or not. My second question is, the site plan that we've been getting, the conceptual plan, even though there's a lot of things on this plan that are not set in stone, such as renderings and things of that nature, how much is a developer able to deviate from a conceptual plan? 
i.e. how much do these roads measurements things of this nature on you know the site plan that's given how much do they have to stick to it because if these special use permits are granted they just grant heights and setbacks and things of that nature but how much leeway do they have to change or vary from this conceptual plan the there's they're proffering that it's going to be in general conformance with their plan so they're showing you their ba their basic design and that's what they're going to do now a little tweak here and there is, is in general conformance but they can't move streets and they can't real they don't get to move all the pieces around on the yeah, page okay just want to make sure how stuck we are with that well and you say that's the conceptual design the the appearance what it's all going to look like they they've offered they've showed you pictures of elevations but all of that from the very beginning has been subject to uh, review and approval by the bhar and now they've gone further than that they've said that it will not not, not just that property located in the existing historic district but all of it so for example all the single family houses they're going to be subject to approval all the the apartment buildings if they're approved the elevations and designs have to come to the bhar and be uh, approved by the historic board Attorney Riddick, procedural matter. There are six special use permits in this. We address those individually. You, you can. We do not vote on them individually. Well, we vote on the whole application. You, know, you, can, you can vote however you wish. It's up to, it's really the pleasure of the council. You can, I would suggest that the, that the first order of business would be the overall zoning. And then you take the, the special use permits. I mean, or someone can make a motion to approve it all. That's that's within the purview and decision of the members of the planning commission. Okay. Well, understand we've had the public hearing portion already. Would the applicant like to add anything? And then we'll return to Planning Commission comments. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Bruce Berlin, one of the managing partners of Venture Realty Group, located at 1081 19th Street in Virginia Beach. Unfortunately, Joe Luter IV is unable to be here tonight due to vertigo, so I would like to read a letter written by him today. Quote, good evening. I am sorry I could not be here tonight in person. Our team provided all the updated information that you requested to include VDOT comments that are fully supportive of our traffic improvements and plan, the updated fiscal impact analysis, and our revised proffers. We hope that you will be in a position to vote tonight on our project, The Grange at 10 Main. The team is here to answer any questions, and we have included our traffic consultant, Karen McPherson. Tonight I want to speak about two words that have been associated with the Grange at 10 Main project, instructed and ordinary. It has been written that I was instructed to withhold financial information from the Planning Commission. That's just not true. No one at the town or the county ever instructed me to withhold any information from the Planning Commission. 
let me elaborate on the sequence of events. As this project started to take shape, my development partner, Venture Realty Group, believed we had justification for seeking reimbursement on the infrastructure. This belief was based upon experience they have had with other Virginia municipalities on mixed-use projects with public component components to it. We did schedule Zoom meetings with both the town and the county to share our overall master plan and the estimate infrastructure costs associated with it. As these meetings were preliminary, we asked both the town and the county to keep them confidential. They agreed as we were not making any specific requests. These were fact-finding meetings to explore project but for tax financing mechanisms to include tax increment financing, special service districts, and the like. The county specifically instructed us to send our information to Mr. Bobby Jones so that the information would be kept confidential. It was stamped and delivered confidential. It is unfortunate that it was released as that information was preliminary and is no longer relevant to the project. In our meeting with the town, we asked about the process of seeking reimbursement and who would make that decision. When told, and I used the word instructed, that the Planning Commission had responsibility for rezoning and that town council had responsibility for any financial decisions, i.e. infrastructure reimbursement, we prioritized our efforts on rezoning. Cost reimbursement is irrelevant to the land if the land is not rezoned. In the same meeting with the town, we were also instructed that the town would not consider infrastructure reimbursement for the private portion of this project. That would be our responsibility. We will revise our financial model if and when we have a plan that the Planning Commission has approved. We note we have modified our plan countless times based upon feedback from the Planning Commission and interested parties. We have attempted to be collaborative and transparent since this project began. I have stated publicly and to the Smithfield Times that we will make any request for reimbursement available to the public when we formally ask for reimbursement from the town and the county. Keep in mind that neither the town nor the county are required to offer reimbursement. But we believe it is fair and reasonable to ask for reimbursement given, one, the nature of this mixed-use public-private development, number two, the contributions of cash and land of the Luter family, and number three, the but-for net economic benefit this project will provide for the town and the county in the amount of over $30 million over the next 25 years. John Gibson will walk you through this in detail shortly. I have also stated publicly and want to reiterate that my father is not seeking to make money on this project. Any profits he makes will be given back to the town for further improvements. With respect to ordinary, Mr. Torrey wrote in the Smithfield Times last week that, quote, reasoning with Mr. Luter is our only good choice because his father has built some very ordinary work in Smithfield years back is just bad thinking. Unquote. I repeat, quote, reasoning that Mr. Luter is our only good choice because his father has built some very ordinary work 
in Smithfield years back is just bad thinking, unquote. Mr. Torrey, nothing about my father's life, his business success, and his philanthropy to the town of Smithfield and the Isle of Wight County are ordinary. I would say that over $10 million of contributions to date are extraordinary. Do our residents and visitors think Windsor Castle Park is an ordinary park for a town of our size? I call it extraordinary. Do the residents and visitors think that the Joseph W. Luter Jr. Sports Complex is an ordinary sports complex of a town of our size? I call it extraordinary. Do the residents and visitors think Smithfield Foods corporate headquarters is an ordinary headquarters? I call it extraordinary. Do the residents and visitors think downtown Smithfield is an ordinary small downtown? Perhaps it once was, but not today. It should be noted that the residents and the business owners on Main Street deserve so much of this credit. Their work daily, along with tourism and Smithfield Foods, keeps downtown thriving. This is extraordinary. Today, our farmer's market does incredibly well. But its viability is uncertain given its location, current lease agreement, and insufficient space for exp expansion. What we propose allows for future growth and will be extraordinary. Current resi residential rental options today are older and limited. What we propose is extraordinary. Smithfield Foods and the town have told us that we are missing revenue generating opportunities due to insufficient hotel space. What we envision will fill that void and be extraordinary. As my father has done with other projects in the past, we are proposing to build an extraordinary community project on the western entrance of downtown Smithfield that complements the architectural style of downtown and provides needed amenities to the residents and business, businesses for generations to come. We ask for your decision tonight and would greatly appreciate your support. Unquote, Joe Luter IV. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the Planning Commission, I am John Gibson of Virginia Beach, and I'm one of the managing members of Venture Realty Group. As you know, we are here in support of Joe Luter and his father, and intend to partner with the Luters in the Grange at 10 Main. Like Joe, I would like to respond to the word ordinary as it relates to my firm's experience, and then I would like to highlight a couple of items in the fiscal impact analysis that you have and is available to the public. First. Venture has developed a variety of projects collectively valued at $1.5 billion in excess. Our partial roll call of award-winning projects includes the following. Cost Plus World Market Isle of Wight Fulfillment Center. Red Mill Commons. Red Mill Walk. The Crossings at Red Mill. The Virginia Beach National Support Centers for Anthem. Edinburgh Commons. The Marketplace at Hilltop. Venture Apartments in Tech Center, Newport News, Virginia. The Ellipse Apartments in Hampton, Virginia. In addition, the highly anticipated Atlantic Park Mixed Use Project in Virginia Beach and the Allure Apartments in Chesapeake are both now under construction. These projects will win awards as well. Whether they're developing new to market retail, industrial, or apartment home communities, Venture's work can be viewed as nothing but extraordinary. We have won awards from planning commissions, city councils, newspapers, the ICSC, garden clubs, just to name a few. <coughs> Pardon me. More importantly, 
and perhaps our greatest testament to success is our customers' gracious acceptance of our product year after year after year. Excellence is not ordinary. Next, we would like to call the Commission's attention to the executive summary in the fiscal impact analysis prepared by Ted Figura Consulting. The slide is, is on the screen in front of you. First, let me state that Ted's service was suggested by the town, and his report is one of the most thorough I've reviewed in my 40 years in business. From the slide on the screen, you can see Figura projects that the county will receive $607,000 per annum net of expenses. TIP's cursor is now on the $607,000. That's the county's portion. The town's portion projects, Figura projects that the town receive, will receive $564,000 per annum net of expenses. This benefit to cost ratio is a very healthy 2.27 to 1 for the county and an amazing 4.34 to 1 for the town. Again, these are net revenues after the consultant factored all reasonable costs, including education. This ratio was inaccurately reported recently in the Smithfield Times. We'd like it corrected for the record. Thank you for your continued time and attention. We've been before you a number of times. We appreciate your commitment to the public and the town of Smithfield and the county of the Isle of Wight. We're hoping you vote yes for the Grange tonight. The project as conceived is extraordinary. I'd like to introduce Brian Rowe, our partner, and after Brian, Karen McPherson will address traffic. Thank you, John. And Mr. good evening, Mr. Chairman and Planning Commission. Thank you for the opportunity. You haven't heard a whole lot from me during this process because we're just we're the um, building partner for the single family for sale product in the neighborhood. Uh, we're proud to be have, have been selected by the Luter family and by Venture to be involved in this project. And they did they made the selection based on our reputation in the Hampton Roads market over the past 35 years. Uh, I've been building uh, custom homes and high quality homes in Hampton Roads for more than 35 years. I began in Williamsburg and, and worked my way back to Hampton Roads. I am a Suffolk resident, as mentioned earlier. Um, we currently build with Weldon Field and Row um, a number of different uh, types of product. Uh, someone mentioned earlier tonight about one of our retreat at projects and over in uh, North, Suff North Suffolk and Bennett's Creek. That is an that is an age-targeted, age-restricted neighborhood, 55 and older, and it's an all-attached type product. There's nothing like what we're uh, planning to build here. Again, we build a range of products from multi-million dollar single-family homes to $400,000 attached product, which is what's in Bennett's Creek, at the, at the neighborhood that was referenced. We engage for the Grange, um, one of the, a, a, a well-known an award-winning uh, architect, Guernsey Tingle, out of Williamsburg. They have done a tremendous amount of work in the Colonial Williamsburg, developing cottages. Uh, they've done a lot of work in Bluffton, South Carolina, doing cottages in different, different neighborhoods. And Tom Tingle himself has personally worked on these designs for this neighborhood at the Grange so that we can actually basically make our single-family detached product neighborhood just an extension of Gray Street. Some of the variances that, requested, that are being requested in this application are so that we can actually attain. If you see the pictures here, we're trying to maintain the housing up on the streets and near the sidewalks. And we want all the garages to be behind the homes as opposed to up at the front of the street, like some of the newer neighborhoods that are in uh, the town of Smithfield. This is basically just going to be an extension of Gray Street, um, extended into this brand new community. So um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge to do. And you can see architecturally, there's an awful lot of detail on these homes and we plan to execute excellently in, in this particular use here. Uh, we're excited about it and there's nothing that we're gonna do here that could be deemed ordinary, I can assure you. The, the amount of detail and the amount of um, uh, offerings that we're gonna have here from the exterior finish to the interior finishes, the amount of landscaping that we're gonna do is extraordinary for sure. And let me also say this, there's a is it a clubhouse and a pool that is being built within our neighborhood? There seemed to be a little bit of confusion earlier about the pool in the neighborhood. 
This is by no stretch a community pool. The, pu the, the public is not being offered to pay for it. This clubhouse and pool and amenity is gonna cost over $1.2 million for me to build within my segment of the community that'll be offered to the folks that buy in our community that we're developing. I just didn't want there to be any confusion on that. I've heard mention of the community pools. We found out through our developments throughout the country that a lot of people are getting away from community pools. COVID had a little bit to do with that. Um, and then secondly, it's, it's a very big liability for the municipalities that own community pools. And that's just something to consider as you continue researching different uses throughout the community. So thank you once again. I just wanted to mention um, our plan here is to do something very excellent and we're excited to be involved in it to have been selected um, and, I, and I appreciate your time tonight. So thank you very much and I would like to introduce Karen McPherson with McPherson Design Group who is the extra um, traffic engineer. Thank you. Karen. Well good evening. My name is Karen McPherson. Um, I'm at 317 Office Square Lane in Virginia Beach and while you haven't heard from me directly on this project I know you've heard about traffic a lot through the process. I understand you have some questions tonight as well as the residents have um, Answer, ask some questions. I would like to tell you that this uh, study has been evaluated thoroughly. Um, we've worked with your staff over the last year. We've worked with VDOT and we've worked with your consultant, Kimberly Horn. In the interest of dating myself, uh, prior to opening my own firm 10 years ago, I was a senior vice president at Kimberly Horn for over 20 years. You are in good hands, and I will reiterate this analysis and this study area has been looked at thoroughly. Through all the analysis, we have been able to achieve a level of service C, which is a very acceptable operational um, intersection. We understand that working in a textbook is not the same thing as living through it. So what I wanted to uh, address is some questions you raised at the intersection of Maine and 10. This is the VDOT project. Today, what you have at this intersection is one lane in each direction. As part of this project, VDOT's gonna add some capacity on Main Street, as well as fix some access management for the parking lot ride. When we look at operations, you can fix the operations by two way. You can add lanes and you can add green time. And so the next slide, what I wanna share with you, and I apologize if I get a little geeky, um, when we look at level of service and we give more green time one way or another, we had to do a lot of queuing analysis. And we have these softwares, again, VDOT looked at it, your consultant, your, your staff looked at it. We looked at queuing, three different types of queuing. I'm not gonna go into all this, but at the end of the day, what we were evaluating is how bad do we think the queues are gonna be in the storage lane? And based on the proposed concept at this intersection, with the development at full build out in 2036, we are going to get acceptable operations. Operations meaning level of service and queuing. So if you all have some more questions, I'll be glad to dive into the details a little bit more. But I just wanted to say, everybody looked at this under a magnifying glass and we were very comfortable that this was going to provide acceptable level of service. Um, the next slide, again, we can get into more detail, but one of the other things, and if you could go back to, uh, to the layout, just the overall layout, a couple of things I did want to point out, oops, there, is that in addition to just looking at level of service at this one intersection, we looked a lot at the internal roadway network. We understand that Grace and Cary are residential streets, and yes, we are providing connections to this residential community, but our roadways are facing outwards towards Maine, and the first thing that we discussed was the limited access on 10. So our hope is that as people are going to the residential, they're going through on 10, not turning right on Main. So we did everything in our internal street layout, again, that are public roads, to orient traffic to the public street. So again, just wanted to point that out, um, address your questions. And again, as we move forward, we'll continue to partner with VDOT and phase um, our development to coincide with their improvements to achieve acceptable level service throughout the duration. So I'm going to turn it over. Is it, are we at the end, Melissa? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then that also just, there are several improvements that we are proffering as well. Hold on. Better part of the traffic. 
Um, correct. So if we pull this up, as far as um, the improvements, the, the first and, and most significant improvement is the shifting of Gray Street to Grain Street, which is across from Church Manor Drive, and to truly create a front door traditional four-legged intersection with a dedicated left turn lane um, to provide direct access into the development. The site driveway further south will be a right in, right out. There will also be a connection um, to the north on Cary Street. And again, that's way up there on Cary Street to the back end of the residential to, to the left. Yep, and, and that will be just a, a, just a direct access and again, a residential connection. And then finally on Main Street, that's where we're requesting a limited access break to allow right in um, and more direct access to the residential parcels to relieve the demand at Main and, and 10. Thank you again for your time, Commissioner, Planning Commissioners and Ch Chair. My name is Melissa Venable, located at 5857 Harborview Boulevard in Suffolk. Um, I wanted to address a couple things, and I will start with the most important. Um, Rick, I didn't spell it correctly, Mr. Lanier? Yes, Mr. Lanier and his father, Mr. Lanier, as well as Pastor... Um, Oh gosh, forgive me, Harrison. I was going to say Harris, and I was going to leave off the sun. Pastor Harrison, um, I want to talk about the pond, and I, I wish I had the best answer, which would be we're going to put it underground. But if you study the topography out here, it will be virtually impossible to put that entire pond underground. We're going to work hard at trying to see how much, how small we can get it, how limited we can get it. But there's a huge topography drop. There is a current and I've mentioned this before, there is a current water issue here. There's a current flooding issue here. And we want to solve that so that Main Street doesn't continue to flood in this particular area. Um, right now, with the information we have, we don't have a better way to solve that current issue other than putting a stormwater management pond. The but to that is, we think um, we've done a pretty good job of addressing the issues and trying to limit the idea, even the idea that you would want to enter anywhere into this pond or that that would be an amusing suggestion. So what we've planned here, and um, it's probably easiest to see on the cross section up top, is you'll have the walkway along Main Street. Along the walkway, we would have um, shrubbery that would have evergreen um, and, and it would be thorny. So we would make sure that whatever evergreen we put there would be thorny, detracting anybody from thinking they want to go through that hedge because it would have thorns on it. Um, so it would be attractive, but certainly you wouldn't want to enter through it. Beyond that would be a, a three to four foot fence. As it was mentioned previously, you could hop that fence if you were able to get through those thorns, but we're going to have the fence with the spikes on top. So again, detracting anybody from the idea of wanting to jump over that area and enter, enter into a pond. Then on the other side of that, remember the ponds have to have a, um, a shelf in them. And then also we'll be, we'll be planting that shelf, again, detracting people from thinking that they can get into the water easily. So we're trying to do our best to one, create a park, um, have a bubbler or fountain within that pond area so it's attractive to the to the uh, folks driving by, but it also adds to um, the park-like setting that we have here where we'll have some benches, a walkway that runs around it, and, um, and seating areas. So we think with those additions, the fence, the um, thorny shrubbery, and then the planting on the other side um, along the pond, that will distract folks from wanting to jump in. I wish I had a better answer. I wish I could say we could put this large pond underground but my fear is that if I tried, I sit here and try to tell you that today, that we would be creating a wall along Main Street that would retain all the dirt that we'd have to have to fill this area in to create underground storage. Um, so at this time, I can't commit to something like that. What I can commit to is um, these addi additions that would distract anybody from coming into the pond. Further, I want to note that every development that we see today um, across the country has to have stormwater management. We don't have a choice and nearly every development, not all, because some can do some underground storage and in this, even in the Grange, we are going to have some underground storage. 
but every development, nearly almost every development, has stormwater management ponds, um, and it's it is. I don't want to say there's never incidents. Surely there are incidents. But uh, as Mr. Luter stated to me, he, um, I think you're more likely having a problem crossing the street than the idea that somebody would enter into this pond area. And I hope that what we're building in um, is, a, is a good distraction for the idea that you would want to enter into this pond area. Further, I want to address a couple of things that I heard this evening. Um, I heard density was just ridiculous and we, weren't, we were asking for too much, but I want to add, and we mentioned this previously, we're asking for a total across the entire project of 7.9 dwelling units per acre. Tammy just mentioned that in her presentation. Um, and your density that you look for within the PMUD requirements is an, also an average of eight dwelling units per acre. So we're not asking for any more in total than what is published in the PMUD requirements. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk about what I heard again and again and again. And Tip, if you don't mind, if you would just scroll through real fast, I think we have the open space um, with acreages on there. What I've heard over and over again is we want an open space and a public park and walkability on this site. We also want things like grocery stores and hardware stores and pharmacies like we used to have. And I wish, I wish I could tell you in that market facility we would have all those things, but I do believe we're going to have the ability to have groceries. The new trend is not necessarily go to the market, but go buy fruits and vegetables from our local um, growers, and we are going to have that ability in the market. With that, we're going to have indoor vendors and also outdoor vendors. So we're going to have both. We know that is part of the plan. Have we conceived exactly how it's all going to work at this point with the rezoning? We haven't. Sorry for the flipping. Sorry. But as, next to the market, we have a large open space area available to the public to gather. I heard that that's something we wanted. I heard in the comments we wanted pickleball in a dog park. Well, lo and behold, we have that as part of the public offering of this project. So a lot of the things that I heard um, ironically that Mr. The, our chairman asked about are things that are being offered in here. We're also offering to maintain those things and build those things so they're not a cost to Smithfield. They're part of our cost. Um, so I think they're part of the offerings and if this is a big plan and it's overwhelming to look at all of it together, but if you zoom in into the parts and pieces, I think it's important to note that so many of the things we heard that were wanted are part of this, including walkability walkways on Main Street that lead you into the community. The community is a walkable community, and we surely hope that folks are walking from Old Town to us, and we're walking, folks from the Grange are walking to Old Town, and this is Old Town. This is part of Old Town, and it's the entry, this, the western entry into Old Town. Um, I want to make sure I addressed a lot of what I heard. 825 parking spaces, which seem like a lot, but then I also heard that we need additional parking, and we're providing that additional parking because we're asking for a shared parking waiver. So we want that parking to be shared. And lastly, one of the things that I also noted, and we've talked about this, um, the environmental studies, and I'll note again, we've had a phase one environmental study done, a phase two environmental study done by outside consultants, an archaeological study, a grave study, and I can, I think we mentioned these previously, but again, I'll mention that it was Bay Environmental that worked on this. We also had some soil testing done by GET. Thunderbird Archaeological for the initial grave study, as well as a phase two, phase one and phase two, and Circa. Um, cultural Resource Management, who followed up on the grave study, as well as Forest Environmental Services, Inc. for the ground penetrating radar. All those studies have been submitted. They've all been completed and accomplished. Um, and I will stand by if you have any additional questions. I, I hope I covered most of what I heard tonight. I'm sure I may have missed something, and I'll stand by. Thank you so much. Ms. Venable, thank you. Commissioners, we've heard the case. Can I ask a question? Comments? Ms. Vulnerable, we haven't seen anything about a sign introducing this development. 
do y'all have a sign proposal or anything yet and how you're going to incorporate that around Grain Street and, and the retention pond and things of that nature? We don't at the point. Well, it was, we did talk about it early on. What we don't want to do is distract from the schoolhouse museum um, or the park entry because we feel like the park is a real positive. So um, some of what Ms. Luter talked about is actually not having a sign letting it speak for itself with the architecture that's going to be proposed. I was going to ask this question of Mr. Luter, but uh, he's not here, so I'll just throw it out to you all. Uh, is there any way that could be economic, economically feasible to make this project smaller, less, less, less of everything? Uh, again, John Gibson Venture. Uh, I can't speak for behalf of the looters. Uh, we think the plan is extraordinary before you tonight. It is the product of national firms, historical concepts, land planning solutions. The best and the brightest have put their energy and efforts into the plan that you see. And so we are uh, a fan of having a vote on the plan that you see in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Berlin, is that it? Yes. I have a question for you, sir. If you may come to the podium, please. During your portion of this, you mentioned something about a tax incremental financing or payment. What? Could you explain that somewhat in detail, please? A, a t yeah, a TIF. So our, our company has been uh, part and parcel to several uh, but for revenue proposals. That's not why we're here tonight again. Listen to Joe's comments as, as you heard them. We may, and we probably will, should we receive rezoning, petition the, the county for a but for revenue proposal. And that would take taxes generated, some of the taxes generated for this project to help pay for the public portion of this project. That would be the underpinning of our request. It would not be a burden to any taxpayer outside of this special service district, meaning the 50 acres in front of you. So, but for this project, it wouldn't have re re you would not have realized any revenue. We, would, we, might, we may ask the town and the county to consider paying from that but for revenue a portion to cover the public expense. It's a simple, it, it, it really is tax increment financing. Have I that would be the responsibility of those in the development itself. Yes, sir. The residents within it. Yep. Would not jeopardize the town's credit rating, the county's credit rating, or anybody's credit rating. And the rest of the town's citizens should not be concerned about any tax increase due to this, due to this development. That is 100% accurate. And this is a request, right, not a demand? That would be a request, request. And to the city council if we understand the structure from the city or the town's attorney correctly. And Mr. And Riddick, we have the, the ability to say no, correct? The town council, town council. does, yes. yes. Thank you. I'd like to address some traffic questions. <laughs> so you hear a lot of the concerns from, from the townsfolk here talking about what currently shows up as level B service. Yet when we do the analysis, we come up and we say, hey, we're going to be at a level C service, and that's acceptable. Right. And I guess that's the question that I think a lot of the people in the room are saying is, is who determines that C is acceptable <laughs> and, uh, and how that impacts us. And then, again, I look at what the VDOT proposal is for the widening 
and the, the lane additions on Main Street. Right. But putting two lanes straight through on Main Street, I don't think is going to address the queuing problems and the queuing issues, and I'm not sure how the modeling turned out. But you're, in order to follow the traffic and the way the traffic rolls, you need two lanes turning on to 10, not two lanes going straight through. But I don't see anything that's adding any additional lanes on the 10 through way. So to address your level of service question, a level of service C is, and forgive me, but the industry standards by national standards, it's anything between 35 and 55 seconds of delay. And I will tell you, most people don't want to sit for 55 seconds. Um, and, and I recognize that, you know, commute, it's, it's all relative. And so while I might compare you to another city in Hampton Roads, um, the residents here really don't want to hear that. I will tell you, as a resident of Virginia Beach, everything I drive through is a level of service E. And I'm sure people are like, great, wait your 65 or 70 seconds and go on with your life. So in industry standards, we are in the 35 to 45 seconds. That is... I have to tell you, unheard of from a build condition. And to achieve a level of service C from VDOT standards is gold standard. They would accept a level of service D, which is like 55 seconds. And so from an operational perspective, when the improvements are built, because Main Street has more through lanes, they are able to reallocate the green time and give more green time to Route 10. So if you have 100 seconds today in round terms, everybody might get 25 seconds on each approaches. If you give Main Street more through lanes, I can give more green time to 10. And so as we look at future analysis and we look at capacity, there's two ways, more lanes or more green time. And so the, the benefit we get on 10 in the future is the green time because of the capacity VDOT is adding on Main Street. So there's all the math. I will tell you, when we did the analysis and the queuing that was requested, we did it for existing, we did it for 2030 background, meaning none of the development traffic, 2030, 2030 background, 2036, 2036 build, and then VDOT asked us to look at and say, what happens if you don't get the limited access break? We run these simulations for 10 times each scenario. So when I say we did it for the extreme, what we report is maximum back of queue, not average back of queue. And even at maximum back of queue, um, we're, we're good. So um, they're the tools of the profession that we use. And I will tell you, they have been scrutinized. I have a request, not of yes. you. Yeah. But you run into this plate. Was it Chip? Was it Chip? Tip. 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 T-I-P. Okay, Mr. Tip. Can you enlarge these screenshots? Um, give me a second. Okay. Not this one in particular. The one that the overall concept. Okay, sure. And actually, I have one yes. that's zoomed in on the commercial yeah. area. I want to see the intersection of 10 and Main. Right, but still. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm calling. Yeah, it's here. Mm -hmm. Is it any way to enlarge that? Yes. With, uh, that, that, that was a little bit better. Go back to that last. Huh. Unfortunately, I, don't, I just have the thumb drive with, um, with this presentation on it, so I can't. What is that? Uh, control, that? mouse roll. Okay, here, here we go. I just found it. Sorry. Here we go. Ooh. 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 Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Here. <laughs> 
No, I suggested that everyone who has uh, concerns about the traffic to look at what the applicant is proposing for this intersection, not just this intersection, but other road ad uh, adjustments as well. If you look, and I don't know how well you can see this from back there. <laughs> I have one. Oh, wow. <laughs> Must that be that fine. <laughs> Somewhere here. Take the laser. Here we go. This other section here. Does it work? No, it's not. It's a flashlight. There you go. There it is. <laughs> okay. This other section here, 10 and 8. I don't know how well you all can see it back there. But the development is adding a dedicated left turn lane coming from Maine to make a left turn on 10. Right, 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 right. A right turn, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this. Make a right turn on lane. And they're being lined to add two through lanes here. There are two through, through lanes here to queue traffic to go through the intersection. The two lanes here. There is a dedicated turn lane to make a left on 10, going this direction. There's a turn lane here coming off 10 to make a right to prevent so much loading in the through lane going there. And there is a dedicated turn lane, which is already there, but the turn lane here prevents so much loading in the through lane. All this is being done by the applicant. And you can and correct me if I make a mistake here. Yeah, it's not being done by the applicant right now. It's being done by others, it's which is by VDOT yeah. in advance. This, this but it's being done. Right. Yes. Correct. This is the VDOT project. Okay. You have a through lane there, a dedicated turn lane, a dedicated turn lane going that way. You got a dedicated turn lane there, and there are two lanes going through the Main Street. One of the lanes would turn in the Main Street's parking lot and taper into a one lane as it is now to continue through downtown. Now I'm saying this because people are saying there's no improvements coming. There is. There's improvements. And then further down, you would have that left turn in lane. From here, going down, you have that right turn in lane to go into the development that will alleviate some of the traffic going this way in regards to this development. Now, if you go up, if you can go up towards downtown just a little bit, where the intersection for Grange and in, in, uh, Main Street. It's difficult to see there. But there's a dedicated turn lane into there. This traffic can proceed. There's a dedicated left turn lane coming out. Dedicated, well, that's a left turn lane, and a dedicated right turn lane coming up to go towards him. And then in application, there's a possibility of adding additional stop signs along Gray Street to slow traffic. I'm just trying to clear up some things here. People keep talking about traffic's not being addressed. Okay, I'm just trying to clear that up.
And I'll stop there with that. And if there's anything else, any other commissioners got comments or concerns, please chime in. So the additional concern, if you're going to go back to that corner, <laughs> since you're still standing. Sure. Um, isn't the traffic coming out of the development, but coming to the development? So when we're coming to the development, you're coming down 10. Today, that's all queued up back to the overpass for Cypress Creek um, during the heavy traffic periods. And now if you're going to have the lights longer for time coming out and there's no additional lanes on 10 to address either turning that faster or getting more people through. So, um, I, yeah, Tip, if you can go to, and I, not to get too in the weeds, but let me, let me share something with you. Um, if you can go to the slide that I had and um, keep going, the queuing, uh, that one right here. Oh, back up one. So, oops, back up one. Okay, one of the things I did want to share with you is from a signal operation, these signals are smart, our technical term is actuated. And so when we put in timings, believe it or not, they don't run the same in the morning as they do in the PM. And so the timings that we have were provided from VDOT and you will see that the northbound movement gets more time in the PM than it does in the AM. Because in the AM, 10 gets more green time. So what you see here is our reflection of comparing, because we wanted to be, again, based on the VDOT comments, comparing 2036 background, which is just growth, and then our development. And this is six years beyond our development. We took the same timings, and with this, again, with the VDOT allocation of green times, this is what is able to get a balanced delay and a level of service C. So they were looking at the human. I will say, as the development progresses, you can come in and retime it and say the demand isn't on Main Street. You can give North South 10 a little bit more time. So the signal is smart enough that you can adjust the timings to reflect what actually is occurring. And so, you know, this is what we projected 2036. I'm sure we can retime it a few times between now and then to address any queuing that may be occurring. So we'll get out of study all and back to the pretty pictures. <laughs> yes. A rhetorical question. Yes. When you have two lanes merge into one, so you're going to have two lanes on Main Street coming past the parking lot merging into one, can VDOT put up an etiquette sign of how to, <laughs> of how to merge and not um, who has the fastest car? No, and I, I've, we've seen many publications on the beauty of the zipper and the queuing yes, and the merging. Yes, could you teach the, the beauty zipper of the zipper? Merge, you know, please, if there's asphalt please. there, you know, let's play fair. But, um, it's not a signing thing. It's more of a. Um... But the real concern, I think, I mean, this is a concern, but sure. a secondary concern is we've got 5,500 trips coming out of, in and out of this development on a daily basis. There is essentially one main exit. And if I interpreted the traffic impact study correctly of what I've read, 90% of that traffic is going to come out of Grange Street. What the residents are concerned about is as you come down Summit Street and Karen's Way or whatever it's called, I know. what mm -hmm. is going to make them come to Main Street on Grange and not go down Grace to further consolidate Grace or congest Grace? So the Grace Street um, is actually getting relocated to Grange Street. Right. And so and I will say that was one of the first discussions we had with VDOT as far as access management on, on Gray Street to get appropriate storage. And they were very protective of the improvements they're getting ready to have at 10 in Main. Um, and so the other, the existing Cary Street that connects to Main Street is actually an end. So for, as people are coming down Grace, if they want to continue to avoid Main Street, now they have to come through another stop sign and into an extended residential development and turn at Grace and the Grange. VDOT asked us to go back and add that in, and even though it's a public street, it was more of an internal residential public street, we had to go back and look at queuing there and that's where we came up with the stop control. And again, to not encourage, you know, through traffic along Grace Street. So, you know, potentially we could have less people coming through the neighborhood. But also in your modeling, mm -hmm. 
you had indicated going back up to the YMCA driveway, which would be the residential sort of exit onto Cary. Yes. Your modeling had suggested, mm -hmm. can't quote the number off the top of my head because there's a lot of diagrams in there, but you only suggested about 10 to 20 trips coming in and out of that exit on a daily basis. Why so few? at that entrance because the residents on Cary Street are worried about how much traffic is coming up and down there, but your modeling shows very few cars coming out of that driveway. Why? So when we had very, at the very beginning, we took each type of land use. So when you look at the residential use, it was based on input from um, the staff relative to where the work trips were gonna be. So if you look at, that's a home trip, where am I gonna to leave to go to work? And, and so those distributions that are in the technical appendix, we did it for the residential, we did it for the hotel, we did it for the apartments, and then we did it for the commercial on Main. So we broke this development, even in this size, into individual pods and got input from the town and the county and VDOT on how we think people would use each and every driveway. So um, that came from input from all the stakeholders. So and again, so that was so low based on where, where it was agreed that the work-based trips would be headed. So again, maybe I'm missing the point, but on Karen's Way, which is the road beside COP. Correct. When you get to the end of that road, what would make me turn right to come to Grange or left to go to Grace or go down Grace? I'm trying to figure out why, wh what's going to discourage traffic going down Grace because that's what the concern is in the room. So when you get, you know what I'm saying, come into Karen's way, you're Correct. going to have to leave to go to work. What's going to say I'm going to turn left and go down Gray's or say, you know what, it's easier to come right and come down to Grange? Um, because that's 5,500 trips, 90% of that is coming that direction. So um, the residential trips that were destined out were directed more towards Main Street. And so if your destination is main to the intersection of 10, that's why the coming down of Karen and you would turn right and then left because your destination technically was to the south at main and 10. So when we distributed that, that's where we thought the majority of the trips would be destined from, from the residential, if that's your destination, which from an employment perspective, that's where we thought most of the people would be headed. Again, not we, the consultant, we, the, the consultant and the stakeholder input. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. McPherson. This is not the end of it, but we've been here about three hours and I would like to suggest we take like a 10 minute recess and continue this on. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. 10 minutes, it's 9.25, we continue at 9.35, thank you.
shoulder, that's for sure. But I got a long ways to go to give the stability issues squared away. Um, the doctor I went to the other week and the therapist both seemed to think I had a mini stroke. That's what they're going to work towards. My, when I walk, when I get up, sometimes I'll take two steps forward and I'll take five or six back. And that's leading them to, to be thinking that. Don't teach a girl like that. Seriously. I'm too old. Let's send it out. <laughs> we should have done that earlier. Let's do that about 6.35 next time. Dr. Pope, Dr. Pope, we're ready to start. Okay, to continue where we left off at, uh, Planning Commission, you may still have questions for the applicant. And applicants, you all can choose whoever respond. Please. Commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I want to have a, a comment for the applicants, but I want to address a few things that were said tonight. Um, um, in the comments, someone said, uh, uh, we don't care about the town as the Planning Commission. Uh, I'm here because I care. Um, and someone who says it's your town, it's not your town, it's our town. And someone said we give no value to the citizens. We're sitting here because we value our citizens. And we take what you're saying. Um, someone said that we need to be good stewards. I think everyone up here wants to be a good steward in the responsibilities that we've been given. Um, and someone says, Mr. Chair asked, well, what would you do? The best answer I heard was, there's no perfect answer. There's no perfect answer. So, you know, I, I thank the, the, the group for what they've submitted. Um, there's no perfect answer, but we have to do what's best for the town and the citizens, which makes the town. Objectively, I might add. Mr. Yoko? So I guess I'd like to start with, you know, how it's currently zoned. We're looking at rezoning this parcel and figuring out how this goes. And if you look at how things are right now, um, we could end up with uh, some nice businesses across the back of this lot because it's currently, currently um, commercial mixed use. So we could end up with a nice caliber collision back there, a couple of automotive repair shops, um, some more storage buildings or something else back in that area. And I don't think that's the, the vision that anybody has for you know, a potential use for this. Um, like I said, currently the only historic area is some of those smaller lots right down in the front, um, which would leave the rest of this open for a lot of different development. So I, I don't think that's what we're looking for to. So I wasn't involved in the planning commission when y'all did the work on coming up with the PMUD zoning criteria, but I do understand that a lot of time was spent in developing that and it has some of the rules of the road that we, you know, that were decided back then. Um, so I've listened to a lot of the comments on the density and the concerns that are there and some of the special use permits that are here. 
are looking at that density and I understand your proposal in saying that, hey, we're at 7.9 and the number is eight overall, but I think part of the, the zoning ordinance that was put in place before I got here talked about that maximum density that we wanted, which I believe was put inside to limit the size of the buildings, to limit the density that was in those areas. So I understand building it so that you hit that average and you get the numbers where we've got them, but you're getting there by exceeding those numbers. Um, and then another is the parking. And because of the density requirements, you're looking for the, the special use to, to get the waiver from the parking numbers. So I don't do the exact numbers. I'm just looking at rough numbers in my head. If I were to take the top floor off the two floor, four story buildings, that's probably about 16 units per building. So that's taking 32 or so out of that building or out of the whole development. If I drop from 201 and drop, or 212 and drop 212 down to whatever the number becomes, you're gonna get pretty close to the parking number, um, probably maybe even a little bit below the parking number that's there now. So you would reduce the numbers there, we would reduce the density, we would reduce the traffic numbers, we might be able to increase the level of service. So I'm just, when I look at what already has been done and what the concerns of the citizens are, what we did when we developed the planning ordinance to begin with, I guess where I'm at right now is I have trouble with, with those two specific exceptions just because they're violating what we worked or you all worked so hard to develop to begin with with the, the numbers. So I heard the question asked a couple of times, hey, what happens if we drop this off? Is it insurmountable? Can we not do the development? Is it not there? So I, I hear that's part of it, but I think you know when we when we have the the numbers that were there for the development, and you're asking for it, the changes. Again, is there I, any? I believe I've answered that question previously. Yeah. So Can I understood. That? Sure. The parking request is to go from, just to give the numbers, 2.3 spaces per multifamily unit to two. <clears throat> if we do the 2.3, there's a lot of extra parking, and it's been shown, and I mentioned this in our last meeting, over and over and over again, and specifically by us, I don't remember the consultant's name. Um, there, there's the consultant that, um, th that does these parking analysis with mixed-use developments. The most we would ever need is 1.7 spaces per unit. So why add all that extra pavement to the project if it's not needed? We're putting two spaces, we're asking for two spaces per unit, not 2.3. 2.3 is excessive. Um, so, so we're just not doing that additional but tax, parking. But all the revenue numbers and all the financial estimates are talking about having on average 2.2 or 2.3 cars per residence as part of the that, tax now revenue. Now you're talking on, about single family residential well, as well. Well, understood. So that's, they're, that's just not that's true. In the, um, we have an operator of a thousand units, parking homes. And, and I can tell you the Virginia Housing, formerly VHDA, their spec and guideline benchmark is 1.7, not two and not 2.2. Uh, in fact, they've gone as low as 1.5 parking spaces. So the, the, the standard of operation in today's practice is fewer parking spaces, not more parking spaces, for a lot of reasons. Shared parking, uh, Uber, uh, and the fact that people are walking more, and that's what we want in this community, is for people to walk more. In our 1,000 units, we have not built to 2.0 parking spaces per unit at all, ever. Chairman, if I may, I want to try to explain something because, Mr. Yoko, you weren't here, and this is really hard to explain, but I'm going to do it in a nutshell if I can. The whole PMUD idea was they, the, the, the ordinance set basic minimums, but if those were meant to be inviolate, there would be no provisions for special use permits. The whole point of the, the PMUD, and this came from our 
comprehensive plan consultant. They're the ones, you know, everybody says that, that this was designed for one person in mind. Then no, it's not true. This was developed because our comprehensive plan consultant said, you, the town of Smithfield is behind. You're not, you are, you're not current with, with um, zoning, um, the, the up, most up-to-date zoning tools. And so that's why Pima is designed the way it is. It allows a mixed-use development, and it allows a developer to do exactly what they've done. I'm not saying you have to like it, but I'm saying that's why it's done. The fact <coughs> that there's so much being made about it, if, why should you approve this if anybody's asking for special use permits? The whole thing was designed to permit that so that people could have, developers, property owners, could have flexibility, and they come in with a design that they think is most appropriate for their property, however it's situated, and they could ask for this, that, and the other thing. Um, and and let's, I won't talk about the parking and these things, but like for um, setbacks, well, they're asking for zero, zero lot lines. Well, that's exactly what you have on Main Street. That's a zero lot line. You know, the Taste of Smithfield and the ice cream bar, they're all zero lot lines. Well, that's what they're asking for. The minimum says, I forgot what, 10 or 20 feet or something like that. Well, they're trying to design something that is more akin to Main Street. So that's just an example. And I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying that the process was designed just so that they could do this thing. And the fact that an applicant asked for a special use permit should not be perceived as they're asking for something that they shouldn't be granted because they're asking something that, that you never considered if, if it was going to be inviolate, there would not be a provision in that ordinance to allow for a special use permit. And, and I understand. Okay. No, but and, I mean, that's, but that's, and, and I know you weren't involved in all that, but I'm just saying that's why it's there. You can have your own opinions about that, but just in and of itself, the fact that, that an applicant files for a special use permit is, you may not like the special use permit, but that, just the fact that they included it is not something that you could, could, should consider um, to be some special consideration. In most places, they're called conditional use permits. Ours are called special use permits. Just that the county is conditional, ours is special. It's the same thing. It shouldn't uh, be perceived as a negative. Yes, correct. I'm not perceiving it as a negative. I'm perceiving it as we set out guidelines of what we, as the community, thought we wanted to see in the development. I look at them as a way to help create. It's a give and take. We give, the, give, the applicant gives, and that way we massage this to what we can live with the same way the zoning is. Because you're right, that's why O'Reilly's is beside Advanced Auto. It was zoned commercial. We couldn't dictate what goes there. All we could dictate is what color the building looked like in their landscaping plan. And that's why you have two auto parts store beside itself. So if this is zoned commercial, they could put a caliber collision or not picking on that business, but any type of business that you may not want there. An auto parts store with 20 cars stored out front. I don't know. But that's the issue we run into. It's a give and take the same way as that lot of our zoning is very restrictive so that when it comes up to rezoning, we have some say and some give and take in the process. So far, it sounds like giving, but we haven't seen a lot of we haven't seen a lot of other things coming back on some of these concerns we have about traffic and heights and density and parking and things of that nature. That's why we have such stringent guidelines in the BMUD or residential and all those types of things. Yes, the pre-MUD, that was created to provide any applicant with versatility, options, creativity, flexibility, innovation, and designing their own build strategy. The ordinances we had prior to that were very restrictive. The PMUD was designed to incorporate any of the other ordinances, as well give the applicant some options. So by right, they're entitled to a number of things, and by special use, they're entitled to a number of things. And they're not asking for anything that's not permitted by special use. It is in the PMUD. They can ask for these things. Understood. 
But like I said, it's not that I don't understand that they don't have the right to ask, and I understand that they're asking. I'm simply looking, listening to the concerns of the public, I'm looking at what we developed and how what they're proposing differs from the public's concern and what they developed. I'm looking at the special use permits and saying there's a couple on here that with a design change, I wouldn't need special permits for those because they would be essentially within the ordinance already. So, I mean, they have the right to ask, we have the right to say no. Yeah. Yes. Now I'm gonna read something, and this is something that I pulled from the ordinances, and it was long before PMUD. This was back in 2009, something like that. It was Article 5, Conditional Zoning and Proffers. In general, any applicant for a zoning map amendment, rezoning, may as part of the rezoning application proffer reasonable conditions concerning the use and development of one's property, including off-site improvements that may serve or benefit the specific property and the public welfare. Profits shall only be accepted as conditions attached to rezoning if such property conditions meet the following criteria. And I just pulled out one. There's others, but I pulled out this one. Such conditions, this is number five, shall be deemed necessary and sufficient to offset identified problems caused by the rezoning in the manner not available with traditional zoning methods. The PMUD gives in any applicant additional zoning methods. Again, it allows them versatility. It gives them options, creativity, innovation, flexibility <coughs> to come up with a design that's acceptable to the town. Now, dealing with the proffers, and that, that was a proffer, that was a proffer. There was questions brought up about the storm water, the drainage, the uh, underwater uh, storm water uh, sewers and such. This was from August the 4th, 2009. It's in chapter 12, facilities and infrastructure. Installation of curb gutters and storm drainage is governed by the town's subdivision ordinance, which encourages the installation of a drainage system in all new town subdivisions to ensure adequate drainage of surface and storm water. Now there's more here, I'm not gonna read it all. All plans and specifications for installation and construction of storm drainage systems must be approved by the Planning Commission. Okay, now this is the point I want to get to. All costs of storm drainage, curb, gutter, sidewalk improvements are the responsibility, here it says subdivider, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that means applicant, for a new development unless the town council directs that the subdivider is responsible for only a portion of the cost. That's up to town council. But it says improvements are the responsibility of the applicant for a new development. It's a responsibility of the applicant. It's not a given that the town is gonna pay for this. It's not a given. The option is the town councils. And for the planning commission, this deal about heights. The applicant had revised the multifamily building elevations to improve the colors and reduce their height. They have reduced their height. This might be the third time, I believe. I'm not certain, but at least I know it's twice. They've reduced their height addressing this concern about heights. That was a three-story building. It went from 42, the three-story buildings that they're asking for, went from 42 feet, is now down to 38 and a half. That's just three feet 
above what's allowed. They're not asking for much there. They're not asking for much. The four-story building, from 50 feet down to 46 feet. And these four stories are away from the historic district. And I've said this before, in your historic district on Grace Street, looking across horizontally, across toward 10, there's so much in front of you, trees and other buildings and such, it's not going to be an eyesore to you. You're not going to be able to see it from ground level. You're not going to be able to see it. You're not going to be able to see it. I've been out there. I stood and I looked at it. And you can stand on your own, stand in your front yard and look. You won't be able to see it once this development is built. They've gone down from 50 feet to 46 feet. I think it's time for Tom to say he doesn't like four-story buildings. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, 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 and before you say anything, it's not about the four stories. We're looking at the height. I got you. But We're looking at the height. The third special use permit is granting 52 feet, not 46, <clears throat> unless something has changed and we have not addressed this. You, any of the applicants want to address that? <clears throat> I'm looking at a statement here. Yeah. That yeah. says it's down from 50 down to 46 feet. That's right. And we can make that modification. Um, we can, you can do it now, redline it if you'd like, to 46 and a half, I believe, is what it is. Yes, 40, 46 and yeah. two inches. You can. So, so if you make a motion for approval, that could that include that modification. It could um, be and a that could be condition of your approval or recommended approval of the special use permit. So it's down from 52 to 46.5. Two. 46.2. But then I would make sure all of the heights. I'm sorry, 46 feet, two inches. I keep but saying I would point make sure two, all of inches. the heights in the third, use, third special use permit are adjusted as accordingly. To whatever data you have. According to the resubmittal. Yes. So do we want to take each thing one by one? I mean, do we want to start with the rezoning and then go? to the future land use map amendment and then talk about each special use permit and potentially vote on each thing in sequence. I'm agreeable to that. Idea. Oh, you're not finished. I'm, I'm, sorry. A, I'm agreeable to that. Oh. But I want to remind this commission of something else here, too. That's in our ordinances. We had the public hearing. In our decision, we have three options. We recommend the town council approval of the zoning application as submitted. Two, we recommend to the town council denial of the application as submitted. And three, recommend approval of the application with the deletion of one or more of the properties in the application. Those are the three options we have. But the one that really concerns me is in section E, article four, section E, zoning amendments. The one that concerns me about our responsibility, failure of the planning commission to report within 100 days after the first meeting of the commission, after the proposal has been referred to the commission, shall be deemed a recommendation for approval unless such proposal has been withdrawn by the applicant. What this is saying, if we don't take action, town council gets it, with the understanding that it is approved. On July 20th. Correct. Yes. July 20th. Mm -hmm. That is our absolute deadline. Correct. Yeah. <coughs> so, Mr. Chair, I think we're, we're set to vote. Can I make a comment first? Can you put the renderings up of the three and four story buildings? In order to shrink from 52 feet to 40 to 46 feet, how are you shrinking that building? Okay, so that flat roof keeps you basically at about 46 feet. Because if you have, I don't know what the right 
archaeological term is, but if you have a roof and you have an extended wall high so you can stick your air conditioning units on the roof without seeing them, I don't know if that's a turret or if that's the right thing, but certainly you can shrink a turret by six feet, but you don't change a 10-foot floor. Standard in commercials, 10-foot, 10-foot, 10-foot. You know, if you've got 10-foot floors and you've got spans and steel in between floors, you've got 10-foot, 12-foot, 24-foot, 36, 48. I don't know what the span is for structure, but 46 doesn't take us down. It's still a four-story building. Doesn't matter if it's 46 feet or not. Ground floor is going to be ground floor. You're going to be down, but dropping from 52 to 46 is still going to leave you a four-foot building. You can just drop the turrets. You can get rid of the, you can get rid of the arch on the or the gable on a roof. It, it, it's still a four-story building at 46 feet. From my understanding, your proposal was something about some roof changes or something? That's some right. The, I'm sorry. The old, old building, like I said, had a, um, had a peaked roof, and you, and you measured to the midpoint of roof in that case. This has a flat roof with parapets that would hide some of those condensers and things that I was mentioning. But because we went from the peak to a flat roof, that allowed us to drop the height some. Um, so, like I said, we were happy to include that the 46.5, and I would say the 46.5 just to give us a little bit of leeway when, as opposed as opposed to 46 and two inches, um, just so as they design this, they have a little bit of flexibility, and we're not cutting off our noses. So, uh, does that make sense? Okay. So you've traded off some architectural interest there, though. You realize that. And as you mentioned, we will have to come back with all of these elevations through Bihar and the scrutiny of Bihar. Um, so these are preliminary, and we'll have to refine these and work with Bihar to come back on every elevation. We're, and Bihar will likely say, we'd like to see some more architectural interest. Mm -hmm. What can you do with the roof line? Sure, <laughs> sure, I understand that. I understand that. But the height and the density and all the things that we're proposing, as you asked previously, that allows us to provide the infrastructure that we're building that allows us to provide the three acre park that allows us to provide the farmers market and all the infrastructure that you mentioned. So when you asked if this could shrink down, when we shrink down, the amenities also shrink. Um, so I think that's important that the reason it's the size it is, is to be able to provide the things that run with it, including the, the many road improvements and things. Now, someone mentioned that we'd get something done tonight. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. No, okay. Is, I mean, is anything really going to change in 30 days? Is the applicant going to come back with a new site plan, conceptual plan over everything we've discussed? I What's going to change so. if we vote tonight, if we vote in 30 days? Yeah. Nothing's I mean, going to change. There have been no substantial changes. Right. So I don't think we're going to get anything. I've, drastically different. I've already asked if there could be any downsizing economically feasible, and right. the, answer the answer is, is no. no. So We can get more details on the elevations moving forward, but that's contingent upon approval. So we're not going to get more details about what things are going to look like. If the project doesn't move, you know, project's not going to move forward, they're not going to invest that kind of money. Okay. Well, to your point, it wouldn't make any sense to proffer elevations when you don't have any authority to approve the elevations. I know. Yeah, I'm just saying. No, no I get that. I, I know you do because you sit on the B, B hard, but my point is. That's but I think it would ease a lot of folks' concern right. if they're not thrilled with what the current elevations look like, particularly for the hotel. Um, if they had something with some more detail, it might allay some of their fears about square boxes on the corner. Just as a reminder, um, this property is located within the entrance corridor, a uh, 500 foot buffer, and so anything that's not the residential would still have to come back before Planning Commission yes. for their review and approval for yep. entrance corridor overlay. She's right.
Okay. So we have an application here, and we want to do this. Mr. Chairman, I recommend we go through them in sequence, starting with the rezoning. Okay. The first one is the rezoning. The second one is the, app, the amendment to the land use map. The land use map. The third, and then subsequent third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth are all special use permits. Right. If you don't have one and two, there's no need to deal with any of the rest of them. Exactly. Do we also need to address the proper as part of the No, it's the proper this is they, they, this is conditional rezoning and so that it's subject to the proffers that they have offered. I know the rezoning is contingent on acceptability of the proffers. It's, but they made an application for conditional rezoning. There's, there's straight rezoning, which has no proffers. And then there's conditional, and they have voluntarily, you cannot extract proffers from them. They Understood. Can, they have offered voluntarily what they put in writing, and the most recent version is included the amendment to the McPherson traffic study. That was right. And then subjected the entire development to the BHAR standards. Right. So, okay. Mr. Chair, based on the conversations that we've had, um, the point that Mr. Yoko made about, you know, this, this would give us more control, we could end up some, with something more commercial, something less desirable there, I would move that we um, grant the rezoning to P mud. That's a recommendation for approval. Recommendation it? for approval, yes, sir. I, I second it. Okay. No further discussion? Any further discussion? Okay. This is on, we have a motion and a second on the conditional official zoning map amendment, no, rezoning. No, no. Yeah, no? Yes, it's a rezoning. It's, it is the zoning map amendment, you're correct, I'm sorry. But this is technically known as the rezoning, yes. Okay. I interrupted you. Because you said map, and but that's right. It's the it's the official zoning map. You're good. Okay, You're good. and <laughs> the motion to clear to be clear. Okay, all right. We have a motion. The motion is to recommend approval to rezone to PMUD. We have a motion to recommend approval of the rezoning to a PMUD. Okay. And a second. Call for the vote. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Thank you. The conditional zoning map amendment rezoning. That motion has been approved. The second is a comprehensive plan amendment. This is a future land use map amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none. Do we have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the comprehensive plan amendment, future land use map amendment. Second. No further discussion? 
We have a motion to approve comprehensive plan amendment, future, a future land use map, and as presented, call for the vote. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Thank you. Amendment of the comprehensive plan, future land use map. That motion passed. The next item in this application is a special use permit for multifamily residential dwellings. The applicant seeking, you can see here, 212 apartments close to Route 10. There's a three-story building. There are five three-story buildings, two four-story buildings. Because of course, you can see the details, the carriages, houses. You can see all those details. Because this is a special use permit, you can make and you can recommend an, a, a change to this. And right. they're specifying 52 feet and 39 feet. Ms. Venable, what should those numbers be? 46.2 inches. Oh, well, 46, 46 feet, 2 inches. 46 and a half. Was that, are we voting on all the special use permits simultaneously? No. 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 Because this is just for multifamily, yeah. but since I'm up. But, but it's, it's, it's in the body of your application for the special use permit for the, max, the maximum density. And it's uh, for multifamily, excuse me. And it's, it, specifies, um, it specifies the height of yes. 52 feet for the four-story buildings and 39 feet for the three-story buildings. This is not technically the height that waiver, but, but should it, shouldn't, it, it doesn't right. need to be conflicting numbers in here. Correct. So the four, thank you. The four-story building, um, I believe you have it in front of me, and I apologize, I don't have it in the notebook here. I believe we noted that that was 46.5 feet. Mm -hmm. 46 feet, two inches. I well, keep saying point five. So, well, right, and I'm going to ask for 46, ask for 46 and, a and a half feet. Oh, you asked for 46 so and a half. Just so that we don't need to come back in case we're at 46 and three inches. Um, so I'm going to ask that that is 46 and a half feet. Okay. And then the three-story, I believe we asked for 39 initially, but the elevations that we brought to you were at. It's in there. There it is right there. Okay. 46. 46. <clears throat> 46. Right. Right. And a half. So we're going to ask for 46 and a half. And I believe this slide before that um, specifically notes that we were asking for uh, 38 feet, 5 inches. So 39 feet. So that's 39. And, and you As know, opposed to 42. And that, it already says 39. So that doesn't change. Okay. So that you're just asking for a change from 52 feet to 46 and a half. Now, again, this is not the height waiver, but the language is included on the maximum uh, density. Thank you. Multifamily. Uh, family. Can I ask for a clarification, please? Because I am not for four-story buildings, by voting in the affirmative for this, am I therefore approving two four-story buildings, or am I just approving maximum height? You're, you're so approving multi-family multi multi residential dwellings. That's all. Period. No matter. Yeah. I'm no. not committed to four-story buildings in this not. special use permit. You are not. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Do we have a motion on the special use permit? Number one, multifamily residential dwelling. Do we have a motion? I would make a motion that we approve with the uh, correction 
of the 46.5 <coughs> feet from 52 as presented. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. To approve the special use permit, multifamily residential dwelling with the heights as specified by the applicant, 39 feet for three-story buildings and 46 and a half feet for the taller buildings, four stories, three stories, that's up there. We're just adjusting the height. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions? I just want to clarify what clarification Dr. Pope just got, which is this is for multifamily residential drawings or dr dwellings, and that the height restrictions are addressed on the height restrictions. That is correct. Special use permit. We have a motion and a second. The special use permit, multifamily residential dwellings. Call for the vote. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Special use, special use permit. Multifamily residential dwellings, that motion passed. Second special use permit, waiver of maximum density. And the way I understand it, this is an extension of the historic residential portion of downtown as seen on Grace Street, seen on Cedar Street, there's probably some other streets there, certainly Carey Street, they're dense, they don't have the setbacks. Mayor, so that's, it, not, that's not what this one's driving at. This one is for um, the, the current zoning would allow eight units per, eight, how about, what is the maximum density? 12, 12 units. 12. 12. 12 units per, per acre multifamily. <coughs> They're asking for 27.5 um, because of the large buildings. But there's, there, they've explained that the overall density is 7.9. In other words, they've, there's, the apartment buildings are very dense because uh, they're tall and there are lots of units there, but the rest of the development is less dense to get to the 7.9. So the overall average is 7.9, but they're asking for a maximum density waiver to have apartment buildings that exceed 12 units per acre. Yes, the doesn't residential portion mitigates. Yeah, but it doesn't have anything to do with the setbacks. That's coming, that's another one. Okay. You were talking about how everything on Gray Street is close to the, how it's, it's in close together. That's not really it. That's the, the, the waiver really comes into play with respect to the, the multifamily buildings. The density. Correct. Then I would stick specifically to that point, yeah. density. Density. And I'll stay away from the characterization. But this is for density. And it, to understand, one offsets the other. And that's how we get the average, just to understand. Special use permit, <coughs> waiver of maximum density. Any further questions? Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend um, approval waiver of maximum density. Second. We have a motion to recommend approval of a special use uh, permit, waiver of maximum density, and a second. No further
further discussion? Call for the vote. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Yoko? No. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryant? Yes. Special use permit, waiver of maximum density. That special use permit, that motion passed. Number three, special use permit, waiver of maximum building height. We've had discussions on this. All right, the only thing we need to clarify here, Mr. Chairman, is they already With clarified the 46.5 instead of the 52, and the 39 um, for the, for the three-story building, so that stays the same. Is the hotel still 42? Yes, sir. Okay, so the only one that changes is the four-story building. So that's, instead of 52 <coughs> feet, it would be 46.5. And a half. Correct. Okay. Okay. And you agree to that amendment, correct? Just for clarity. Yes, number three, with the changes in the height, the special use permit, waiver maximum building height was approved with the height changes of the four story building, correct? Yet. No, that's, that's we didn't vote on that? That's the one we're on. Yeah, that's that's the one oh, okay. Just, I'm sorry. That's the one you're on right now. Okay. Yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Approved. Okay. I'm sorry. Back My apologies. Okay. But we have a motion and a second. No. no. We don't have that either. No. Not for the height. We Not just the approved height. multifamily. Okay. All right. Get me back on track. This is specifically for the height. All right. Get me back on track. Need some coffee, Chairman? Maybe. I may need some coffee. <laughs> <clears throat> okay then, number three, special use permit waiver of maximum building height. No further discussion. Call for the vote. No, well, I'm motion. sorry, motion, I'm sorry, call for a motion. Motion, motion. want me to make a motion, I make a motion that we do not allow waiver of maximum building height in favor of four-story buildings as far as I'm concerned. So my motion is to deny the special use permit for waiver of maximum building height. I'll second. You second? I'll second. We have a motion to deny special use permit number three, waiver of maximum building height. And a second. Any further discussion? So we dropped from 52 to 46.5, correct? Yes. Correct. All right. Yes. No further discussion? Call for the vote. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? No. Mr. Davison? No. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? No. I lost tally. Three, one, two. It was. Motion passes four to three to, re to not. To deny. Not recommend. And not recommend. Okay. Waiver of the maximum building height. To deny that, 
special use permit. That special use permit is denied. No, it's not denied. It's, it's a recommendation. It's a recommendation. I'm, yeah, yeah. Because a recommendation to deny. It's, it's, it'll be up to the town council for all of these. I'm yes. Sure. It's a recommendation to the town council to deny number three, the special use permit. Waiver of maximum building height. Number four, special use permit. Waiver of parking and loading requirements. We see the details. Any discussion? Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I recommend that we approve the special use permit for waivers of parking and loading requirements. Second. As presented. We have a motion for special use permit, waiver of parking and loading requirements to recommend approval and a second. No further discussion. Director Clary, call for the vote. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Number four, True. special use permit, waiver of parking and loading requirements is recommended to town council as approval, to approve, recommend approved town council. Number five, special use permit, waiver of yard requirements. This is for relief from the required yard setbacks. And it's at this point that they're trying to duplicate the character of Main Street as it exists now. Is that correct? Correct. And okay. also the historic. And the historic. Residential yes. areas of the historic district. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I would um, make a motion that we recommend approval of this waiver. Second. We have a motion to recommend for approval, special use permit, waiver yard requirements, and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. Mr. Davidson? Uh, yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Special use permit number five. Six. Well, well repeating. Five is approved. Special oh, use oh, permit, sorry. waiver <laughs> yard requirements. Sorry. I'm delirious. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm repeating what we just approved. The special use permit for waiver yard requirements. A recommending to town council approval for that SUP, that special use permit. Number six, special use permit, short term rentals. Applicants, you've seen, seeking five short term rental units. Each unit, single detached, single family dwelling that will be utilized as a rental property. Any discussion? Uh, we haven't really gotten much comment on these, so I haven't really heard any opposition about any of the uh, short-term rentals. So. Does this fall into the Airbnb category yeah. of our zoning ordinance? Yes, sir. Yes, so they would have to be registered. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, recommend we recommend approval for the uh, short-term rentals. Second. 
We have a motion. Special use permit number six, short-term rentals, and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call for the vote. Dr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Davison? Yes. Mr. Yoko? Yes. Mr. Swecker? Yes. Vice Chair Hillegas? Yes. And Chairman Bryan? Yes. Thank you. Number six, special use permit, short-term rentals. It has been recommended to town council for approval. With that, yes. With that, item number nine. This is approval of the Tuesday, April eleventh, twenty twenty three meeting minutes. Mr. Chairman, I recommend approval as presented. So moved. Second. We have approval. We have a recommendation and approval. All in favor, uh, say rec notify it as yes. All in favor, signify by saying ye or yes, whatever. <laughs> yes. yes. Here's yes. <laughs> Any nays? Hearing no nays? No nays. Coffee. Approval of Tuesday, April 11th minutes. Approved. Motion passed. Mr. Chairman, I recommend approval of the May 9th meetings as well. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve May 9th meetings. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 No nays. Approval of Tuesday, May 9th. Meeting minutes have been approved. Move for adjournment. No further discussion. No new business. This meeting is adjourned.